All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to the 2021 Autumn Showcase. Uh, we were hoping that this was going to be a physical in-person one, but it looks like we're all in lockdown in Sydney and Australia-wide as well. So we can we are in the, the great position of being able to do this kind of stuff online. That is the nature of games, uh, and it's a fantastic privilege. So let's get to it and have a lot of fun games. So before we get started with anything else, I'd just like to read an acknowledgement. So uh, I would like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Oro Nation upon whose ancestral lands our city campus now stands. I would also like to pay respect to the elders, both past and present, acknowledging them as traditional custodians of knowledge for this land. I'd further like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of various ancestral lands from which our attendees join us today and to pay respect to those elders past and present. Now to carry on with the rest of our introduction, I will pass over to our co-host, uh, Jamie Garcia. Hi everyone, how's it going? I just want to thank you guys for, for joining us tonight. Uh, it's a special night for us. It's a bit of a celebration for uh, not only the lecturers, but the students. Because today we're going to be showing the best student work from uh, the autumn 2021 se uh, session. Um, will, do we have slides? Like, can we put my slides, please? Y just one are slide, you, please. Are you sharing screen? Yes. Uh, yep, sorry. Jumping on. There we go. Good to go. Okay, cool. So uh, here's a bit of a program. Uh, schedule is a little tight because we've got 21 or 20 plus student projects that we want to go through um, this night. Uh, so I wanted to start with a few introductions. So well, William started the whole thing. Uh, uh, William is the subject coordinator, sorry, the degree coordinator for the Bachelor of Science in Games Development. Uh, we also have Ruben tonight, who's going to be helping us with managing this, the logistics of the event, and me, Jamie Garcia, one of the lecturers as well in the in the degree. Um, I just wanted to talk to you guys about the subjects. So tonight we have participating five subjects. Those are the core game subjects for the Bachelor in Science in Games Development. And we've chosen, we handpicked the top student projects from every single one of them. Uh, it's gonna be an amazing night. We have a lot of projects and uh, just wanted to make a couple of acknowledgements. So I just wanted to acknowledge uh, the Associate Dean, Associate Professor Rob Jarman, who helped us, well, he's helped us a lot with this event. Uh, past showcases. He never misses one of these things, and I hope he's watching us now. Uh, today is his last day, so I just wanted to acknowledge uh, that. And also, I wanted to acknowledge the organizing committee. So, this is the first time in the five iterations of the annual showcase that we have um, a group of students helping with every single aspect of the whole thing. Uh, I want to put you guys in the spotlight here. So, uh, Gloria, Jacob, uh, sorry, Jacob, I'll just get the names. Right. Um, so, Claudia, Agit, uh, Matt, Ruben, Roy, Chris, William, of course, <laughs> Josh, Riley. Uh, thank you, thank you guys so much for making this possible. Uh, it wouldn't be possible without your help. And I just wanted to acknowledge that. And I'm gonna make sure that your face is on the screen at some point. Um, so, yep, yeah, I think uh, that's pretty much it. So, the next step for us is to get started with the presentations. Uh, we're going to go with the final year students first. That's uh, Game Design Studio 1, which is my class. Um, I invite you guys to jump on the voting system. Uh, we're going to give prizes for the best game from Game Design Studio 1, my class. We're going to give uh, prizes for the best student game from Intro to Game Design. That's William's class. And from all the project-based subjects, such as play animation, uh, computer graphics, and games and graphics project, we also have another prize. Um, I think that's it. Should we just move to the next stage of the night? Yeah, awesome. Uh, let me just double check. Okay, so uh, we will quickly pause to make sure that we've got the first game up and running. Uh, but uh, who do we have first on the schedule? We have Calyptus, my favorite game, but um, that's because I made it, so. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> sure. Uh, yeah. Are you ready to share your group? Yes, I believe Joseph is in the chat with us. Okay, uh, in which case I will just get that up and running. And I believe he's sharing screen. Okay. All right. Uh, yep, yeah. so we are now live with your game. Uh, 
Joseph, if you're around, feel free to jump uh, in. Yep. Uh, hello, um, everybody. I'm here to introduce Calyptus, not nervous at all. Um, this is a sci-fi themed platformer slash shooter slash roguelike. And let's jump right in. So, um, yeah, the main aspects of our game are very fast movement, being able to jump, double jump, dash, wall jump, and combine these um, to make your way across the environment. Every time you finish a level, like right now, you'll be introduced to an upgrade screen where you can upgrade your character's mobility, um, obtain a new weapon, or upgrade one of your existing weapons. So for this, let's just go ahead and get ourselves a homing launcher and enter our first real battle of the presentation. So entering this level here, you can see we're now in combat with the enemy. We've got three weapons which we can switch between in real time. The sword, the pistol, and the homing launcher. Let's go ahead and take out some bad guys. So, as you can see up the top, um, there's actually a, a meter that measures how well you're going. Um, it goes from D tier all the way to triple S tier. Um, and that's a score multiplier. Um, and as you damage or kill enemies, you get points. And the aim of the game is to get to the end of all of the levels, but as well get as many points as you can. Um, as you can see, there's also a variety of different enemies. Some shoot at you, some charge at you with swords and weapons, um, and some dash at you and different things. So it's about understanding those enemy types as well. Oh, so so can you guys tell us? Sorry, you go. <laughs> Sorry, no, I was just talking about how I. Yep, I'm dead. Okay, I was just gonna ask you, can you tell us about the inspiration that you guys got for making this game? Or did you guys get inspiration for making it? Mm, I wouldn't say I had a specific game in mind, but um, Ruben, I believe, um, you did? Hades, I believe? Yeah. Um, Hades, so a few inspiration, Hades, um, Slay the Spire, definitely. Um, it also reminded me a bit of Dead Cells through... Um, some of the themes that were going on um in it um but in general it um yeah it's a roguelike hack and slash shooter sort of game so it takes inspiration from a lot of different games um excellent so, yeah sorry chat by the way um i know that my camera is blocking the score and the weapons area um <laughs> Unfortunately, I um, <laughs> I don't know that. if we can move that, William. Yeah. Um, but yeah, underneath my camera is all of the UI elements. Fabulous, yes. Um, so now you can see those different UI. Um, I feel like it's also important to note that um, th there's a pool of levels that it's chosen from, about 15 or so, as well as about 10 or so um different weapons that you can acquire um that all have um, different 13 weapons how many sorry 13 oh 13 i forgot that we added more um <laughs> so yeah like grenades grenade launchers um boomerangs hammers bouncy guns it's all there so it makes a interesting game um because you can upgrade them and every run is slightly different from the one beforehand hence the roguelike nature excellent so can you guys tell us a bit more about the process that you guys follow for making this game um yeah first obviously deciding coding the player's movement and shooting mechanics was priority because that's what everything else is based around but also once we did the player we had to obviously make enemy ai um, I believe Kevin, our other member, was in charge of that, and he actually found a way to have an enemy dynamically 
detect what surface it's on and patrol for its entire length. It's really interesting work. And in addition to that, he also did the shooting enemies and giving them the ability to charge up attacks as well. As well as flying enemies, which are only in some levels, we haven't come across them yet. But yeah, once we sort of laid down the framework for the gameplay, that's when we started adding in the more complicated elements, like the upgrade system, the level randomization, and um, obviously the art came after that, uh, much later in fact. Let's go ahead and grab, you know what, a grenade launcher. Why not? To continue on. Awesome. Um, so can you guys tell us about the tools that you guys use for making this game? And I promise that's my last question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we use Unity um, predominantly. Um, it was made in Unity and all of that. Um, I know I, I made all of my aspects in unity i don't know if we did anything else anywhere else besides like a pixel art maker sort of thing uh yeah yeah i was to count paint.net but no other than that um we we did have the one in charge of art steven new one who isn't with us um was made very excellent uh as you can see for the enemies uh, animated art in fact, so just thought I'd shout, give a shout out to him. Yeah, um, and I saw a few people in the chat mentioning about the camera. Um, we decided to go with a camera that kind of dynamically follows your character as well as your mouse, um, just so um, you could look down and look up and things, which made the level design a bit easier. Um, and made the experience a bit more fun because you weren't just missing out on information as if it was a fixed camera. Um, the stream quality doesn't particularly show that nicely, but um, the game, when you play it, because we do have itch.io links, so if you want to play it, they are there. Um, you can see that it's a bit more stable. Um, yeah. All right. Thanks. Yep. Thank you very and much. We're going to have to wrap up on this one. We are getting through these really quickly, just that everyone has a chance to show the game. Um, but yeah, people are asking about the, the frame rate. Yeah, it is a stream of a stream, as some people have said. So sorry if it, it doesn't look super clear. If you do want to see the high quality games, the link is in the YouTube chat. Uh, you can go play pretty much all of these games uh, tonight. Uh, on your own uh, at, or watch some videos of them and see them actually running at a much higher frame rate. All right, so we'll pause there and we'll quickly switch over to the other stream channel. Uh, so thank you guys. Thank you for sharing your game uh, and we'll be back in less than a minute. All right, we're back to our next game. Uh, Ruben, who have we got on the list? Okay. Um, this is Outside the Box um, by these wonderful gentlemen. Um, and yeah, do you guys want to take it away? All right, so Outside the Box is our own little original uh, tower defense game that really takes things outside the box, huh? Well, um, so uh, uh, Reese and uh, one of the other team members is going to demonstrate the gameplay while me and Patrick are most likely going to explain the game as they play through the game. Hmm. Yeah, so we can yeah. get started. Okay. 
So, so we we kind of took a, a bit of a spin on the normal tower defense genre, and we tried to mix it. Our main inspiration was really um, Overcooked, if you've played that before. Um, and our original idea right at the start of the project was to try and find a middle ground between Overcooked and like a normal tower defense game. Um, so there's a lot more interactivity you know, run around the map. And you create these turrets. Right. So here. Basically, in most tower defense games, after you plant your turrets, basically, there's not that much interaction with the game world. It's mainly the strategic kind of element of you planning out how to spend your resources, where to place your turrets. However, in our game, we made it so that it's much more interactive. You can actually go around, carry your turrets around, and physically place them in the world. It's not just you uh, making it and uh, making the turrets and just like plonking them down wherever you want. It's like navigating the game world is actually part of the experience here. And as you can see, we actually have functioning multiplayer. Yeah, so th there are a lot of things happening at the moment. But, um, so the, there's two players, we've got two of our group members playing at the same time. Uh, one on keyboard, one on controller, so we've got full controller support and everything. But you can carry turrets, you can wield them as weapons, and you can carry them around and they'll shoot in front of you. So any turrets in the game... And the red player is currently is... Well, is currently reloading one of the turrets by physically yeah. whacking it. <laughs> yeah. So, so basically there's a big em emphasis on your influence, which we felt was where tower defense games really lack. Um, yeah. You in, don't really like, sit in... back and watch everything happen. You have that part in the game. Um, there's quite a few things that we designed in order for the players to actually really engage with the game's core mechanics. In, uh, in particular, you have to go out of your way to physically pick up all the cash that is dropped by defeated enemies. You can't just uh, uh, have the money teleport straight into your bank account, basically. Hmm. Guys, we've got a question in the chat. Uh, is this a multi-platform game? Uh, Only we just have it in uh, PC, but yeah, we're, like, we do see a lot of promise in, in this. But yeah, definitely, we've got control support, so all the controls are already built in. It's just more of building it and having it run on a different platform. Okay. So, are nice. you uh, doing this multiplayer? Is this over a network, or are you guys? Yeah, so, we're, so this, we're, using, um, we're using a bit of software called Parsec, which just, it's local multiplayer, but Parsec allows you to, like, over the internet, um, have a controller on someone else's computer. So, so this is just local multiplayer, but, but yeah, using that bit of software. So here we got a question of the chat, and the enemies damage you. So well, basically, once the enemies reach the end, they subtract some of your health from the, your health total. Currently, though, our players are doing quite well at this game, so they haven't received yeah. any penalty yet. It's probably a bit hard, because these are the developers playing. Yeah, uh, and as you can see, some of the players are actually upgrading their turrets by placing another copy of it onto the same spot. So there's an extra layer of progression in the, uh, in the turrets uh, present, and it's not just like you buying more indefinitely. Yeah, so we've got, I think we've got four turrets, and we've got each of those turrets can be upgraded three times. So we've got huge variety. There's a lot of um, potential for you to, to expand your, your arsenal as the game progresses. And um, yeah, I mean, we're super proud of it. Yeah, um, you guys. Well, we're How more. many tiers can the um, turrets go up to? Because I see that we had a tier three turret there for yeah. a bit. So, um, how many? Tier up three two, is the maximum at the moment. Um, and so, like, you to upgrade them, you just combine two turrets of the same type. So two tier ones, two tier twos to get to the next level. Hey okay, guys, I think we gotta move to the next game. Uh, thank you so much for showing us your amazing project. And Thanks, can we please get? Uh, you enjoy the just look at our game. Yep. From from a yep. person's perspective who hasn't seen this before, this is really nice. Uh, it, the yeah. chat keeps going off saying it's super cute, and I agree. It's so nice. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so I overcooked. It's one hundred percent. All right. Thank you very much, uh, and we'll get the next game loaded up. Thanks, guys. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Guys.
Go for it. Okay, fabulous. Um, so that was outside the box. We're now moving to Thorm, um, a roguelike again, I'm pretty sure. Um, I believe you guys have a trailer to start us off. Yeah, let's yeah, for sure. start us off with the trailer. Fabulous. <laughs> Wow, that, that looks really good. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so just just a bit of context though. That trail. Oh, in Minecraft 1.17. Oh. When I thought to no. myself, <laughs> I'm very sorry. <laughs> um. So the audio, all the soundtracks and everything, uh, in the game was made by our group member Jonah. Unfortunately, isn't uh here today. But he, yeah. So he made all the audio. He like either sampled it or you know he had sound bites and stuff that he was able to use. Very impressive. It was insane work from him. Um, but yeah, Matthew, anything? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, Thorn's just a 2D roguelike we made. Uh, so Jake's switching over to the game uh, while I talk. Uh, so yeah, just kind of a medieval kind of style uh, dungeon escape. <clears throat> so uh, with some kind of procedural elements as you kind of uh, go through the dungeons, uh, as you'll see here on the map screen, uh, different uh, options appear on the map uh, as you uh, progress throughout the game. Um, so yeah, we'll jump into maybe one of the top the top on there. Um, so yeah, you can see all the different uh, types of rooms that appear. Uh, I don't know if audio is coming through, but um, yeah, so different types of fighting uh, and we've got some cool keyframed animations there. Um, and so when you can like roll and stuff, uh, it'll actually uh, what do you call it, like make it so the uh, projectiles don't hit you and um, yeah, it's a neat little fighting stuff there and different types of enemies that change depending on how far you get through the game. Um, and yeah, different pickups you get as well. So, and then throughout the game, uh, there are three different types of bosses you can encounter. Um, and then at the end of the game, there's one final boss. So here we are, we're at a boss screen. Uh, so we're going to go up to Derek, who's our favorite uh, boss. So, yeah, as you can see here, Derek is a bit of a projectile boss. So you run up to him, um, and you have to deflect the projectiles by hitting them. Um, but then as you do more damage to him over time, you can see at the top he's got a shield, and he's changed color. Uh, so we kind of worked on our boss mechanics a bunch throughout the game, which was pretty fun um, to work on. So to actually break Derek's shield, you have to deflect the bullets back at him. Um, and yeah, you can keep fighting him in different stages of the fight. Ooh, um, I see that you have a few other special attacks that you're doing. Um, do you want to explain a bit more about what those do and how you came up with those? Yeah. Uh, so we decided that kind of as a progression system through the game, um, we would give you these crystals um, that appear after you defeat a boss. Uh, and once you pick that up, uh, you can see uh, we've managed to get a new ability where we shoot projectiles like Derek did. Um, so I think we've actually run into a training room here. So after you get your new projectile um, ability, you get to have a bit of a sandbox and there's it's just this dude that you uh, run around and can fight. So we talk a bit of inspiration from uh, Hades, the game, uh, where you actually get to have that uh, skelly you fight to practice on. Ah, cool. Excellent. Do we have any kids from the 90s in the chat today? <laughs> <laughs> 
So this is, uh, if you guys can still hear me, this is the uh, fountain room that we've created. Um, nice little heel. Uh, and then I believe next room after this one should be the final room and I'll give a little demonstration on the final boss of the game. So, I mean, it's good to use all your mech, uh, all the new unlocked abilities against him. It does get a bit difficult. Yeah, so in the bottom left there, you can see the uh, indication of what ability you've selected. Um, and here's our final boss feature on a bit of an intro to him and uh, different uh, mechanics that you kind of learn throughout the game of how to fight. Uh, so the green guy you can see there, we've got a uh, uh, ally you can spawn in. That's one of the previous bosses. Um, yeah. Excellent. Okay, guys, I think uh, we've run out of time and we should probably move on to the next game. So thank you so much. And um, yeah. Yeah, thanks, guys. Oh, okay, so now we would like to go with Ambre Lai. Guys, can you please show us the game? No. I got the wrong name, isn't it? Huh? Yeah. Okay, so is this a Japanese inspired game, guys? And how? Why did you choose the Japanese stuff for a game seemingly about an umbrella? Oh, I, huh? I think we may have lost. Seems to us still be working, but the <laughs> yeah, his video camera is paused. Oh. I think he's going to fix it now. <laughs> okay, so I can tell you guys a little bit about this game because it's one of the games from my class. Um, so these guys wanted to go for a interesting set of mechanics where the main character can't jump. You can only use the sword to make that happen. And they wanted to keep it simple. So using the sword, it's kind of the main thing for this game. Uh, there's also a couple of mechanics that you learn as you move through the level. And one of them is an actual umbrella, which can help you to sort of hover over the enemies and uh, strategize your attacks a little bit. And it helps you to sort of uh, defeat the, the main boss at the end. Uh, let me see. Do we have... Yep, you guys are back. Yeah. Sorry about that. I just disconnected. I was talking to myself for a while. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> All uh, good. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure how much Jamie said, um, but the... Well, you can tell us what's the unique element of the game. What makes this game one of a kind? Yeah, I mean, what makes this game one of a kind is its mechanics, really. Um, I think that a lot of um, games that are similar to this are designed to be quite fast. So, like, Castlevania games are meant to be bang, bang, bang. Um, sorry, Metroidvania. Um but what we've done is we've taken that, so we've taken the concept of a Metroidvania and deliberately slowed it. And what you're seeing right now, this pogo mechanic or the jump, was something that we were honestly kind of forced to implement. Um, you know, 
in our first iterations of the game, we wanted to like really kind of mess with the players' mental models about how they had to move through the world and how they had to time their slashes. Um, but it just wasn't resonating with uh, players and play testers. So we had to sacrifice that. We wanted to keep the kind of uniqueness of having, like making it quite hard to jump. And I don't know if you can notice, but every time that he's jumping, the cursor is facing down. And so the concept is that he's bouncing on his umbrella. Um, so in that sense, we've really tried to keep that uniqueness. Um, and I think an interesting fact about this game is that it is the child of super intensive brainstorming. Like I think we did like wordplay and one of them was umbrella. Um, another was samurai, you know, we did, we just started mashing things together That's over the cool. caffeinated course of like three hours. Um, and uh, I think I, 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 sorry, I was going to say, yeah. I personally love that approach to coming up with those initial ideas where you just, you th yeah, play a game, throw out random words, see what kind of sticks a little bit or what sounds humorous and then try and design a game around it. And it always just ends up with wild designs. Mm. So you guys mentioned that there was some play testing and you had people playing with the game and giving you feedback. Can you tell us about that, please? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think some of the initial feedback that we were getting was, as I mentioned about, um, the mechanics, which is super hard. Um, so what we're in right now is essentially a tutorial. So some of the, the key um, feedback we've got was, firstly, what are the mechanics? Secondly, how the F do I use these mechanics? And thirdly, you know, how can I kind of like, you need to give me space to be able to like get comfortable with them. So that's what we've done here. That was really core feedback around mechanics. And the second was level design. Um, you know, I think that in a perfect world, you don't need tutorials because the level design is a tutorial. Um, unfortunately, I'm not a great level designer. <laughs> um, so we had to rely on them. And I think, I, I hope that, you know, uh, you guys can play this in your own time because it's a really rewarding game. Um, and in that Metrovania style, we didn't want it to be too easy. I think I mentioned this earlier. You know, if it's too easy, then it doesn't reward you for putting in an hour on a Sunday afternoon and becoming like a gun at timing your slashes and, and combos. Um, yeah. Cool. Yeah. Okay, guys, thank you so much for showing us this game. Uh, we're going to move on to the next one now. Yeah, thank you, thank you guys. Thank you. Have a lovely day, guys. guys All okay right. um welcome back guys um this is project angel oh i can hear myself one of you has the stream unmuted <laughs> um but so yeah this is project angel and i believe we're watching a trailer first 
Yep. So oh, if you want to hit us with the trailer. Awesome. All right. All uh, right. I'm just going to hide the image while we switch over uh, to the other stream to get the game going. Um, but yep. while I'm doing that, no did worries. that say 30 levels? Yep. yep. There are 34 levels in Project Angel. Wow. So we've been very busy this semester. Um, yeah. We even had levels that we cut out, so there were more originally, but these are we wanted to make sure we had the best of the best. So yep, 34 like that's, levels. That's going above and beyond what Jamie's assessment specs are, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe just a little. Um, we like to push ourselves. We wanted to go big, you know, um, and we're all super proud. Everyone was really getting behind the project. So when everyone had time, it's like, what can we do to improve it? And it just sort of turned into this, you know, the final game. And it's, yeah, we all really love it. Awesome. So yeah. So um, a bit about it. So Project Angel uh, is an action puzzle game it's where you play as the Guardian Angel Lucy, and she's the newest member of the Guardian Angel Bureau. It's her responsibility to protect the simple-minded Dave, who always manages to find himself in dangerous situations. Uh, it's up to Lucy to control the environment around her in order to keep Dave safe. But it's your job to protect Dave and keep him alive for a single day. Can you do it? God only knows. So, yeah, so when we were trying to come up with the idea for the game, um, we had no ideas. Uh, we were really struggling, so just like the previous group, we had a random word generator, I got everyone to throw words at me, and then we picked two of them and we had to come up with a game idea. And I think we went yeah. through about 40 different ideas before we finally I mean, it was came more across. Than 40. Yeah, it was massive. Um, and we stumbled across Angel and Perspective, and then we sort of just threw around this idea. Um, we were heavily inspired by Overcooked. Um, it wasn't that sort of fun, light-hearted sort of quick gameplay. But we wanted it to be simple. Um, so simple mechanics that anyone can pick up and learn, but there's a bit of a difficulty curve and some really good challenges in there. Yeah, um, talking about those mechanics, guys, do you want to explain a bit about some of your mechanics? Because you're showing us some gameplay here. Yep. It might be a bit difficult for some of the people to, at home to understand exactly what's happening. Yep, so it's pretty simple. So uh, we have this timer thing going on. Dave really goes on a straight line like that. and. Um, and we'll just fall down straight away and you gotta try to protect him so for example i can pick up boxes and you can place them down like that and then now dave doesn't really fall to that hole um but you also have to kind of be careful because um dave will kind of try to go towards the goal as you can see the goals at the bottom so he'll try to go to the right uh, side or part of the screen from my perspective and yeah you gotta it's just a lot of puzzles surrounding that those kind of core mechanics, really. Um, those really core and simple mechanics. So this is earlier on in the game. Uh, as you progress through each of the worlds, you unlock new mechanics. So at the start here, you're just moving boxes to avoid traps. Uh, but later on, we have um, signs or arrows on the ground that change Dave's uh, uh, direction. And later on, we also have electric puddles where you have to keep your iron generators as they will electrify a whole area of ground so to watch out for that and when they all get combined together it gets quite quite hectic so, so. i'll show some of the so guys we've got a question in the chat how do you choose yeah. the spawn point spawn point uh, it's a, the same for each um it's, level so it's uh, yeah so on each level we'll show it on this one that it gives playing now so there's a little blue box in there and that shows the direction he's going to come out of um, yeah. So he'll spawn when the countdown reaches zero. So let's run out, and here he is now. I'm just going to speed up time. I can speed up time a little bit, just make things go faster. <laughs> yep, so one of the mechanics we implemented was a speed up function. We found some players were waiting for Dave to get to a certain point, so to make it a bit snappy, we went, all right, sure, 
you can speed up time, make it a bit faster. But it speeds up everything, so it's a bit of that risk reward. You can get to the right spot, but Dave's unpredictable, so who knows what he'll do in that time. Um, uh, so, yes, like when we were designing the levels, um, one of the main things we wanted to keep in mind was that we wanted there to be multiple solutions to every level, so it's not like a set path. People played the game very differently, so it was all about finding a way that allowed people to be comfortable in the game. The game uh, is quite fast-paced, so we didn't want it to be too punishing in that people would die over and over again. There was obviously a bit of that, but we didn't want it to make it where it wasn't enjoyable. Excellent. Okay, guys, I think time's up for this game. Um, I'd like to guys yep. invite you all to put your votes for all the Game Design Studio One games. Um, the link should be open now, and if you guys go onto the website and find the game you like the most, you're going to find the vote button at the bottom. Um, just looking at the program now. I think we're going to take a five-minute break to let you guys yep. uh, stretch your legs, get some water, uh, and we'll see you guys back in five minutes. Yeah. Like James said, Thanks, guys. five minutes. Yep. So we're Thanks. doing categories, best game per subject. So that kind of wraps out uh, the third year subject. So make sure you go vote, vote for your favorite game, and we'll come back and we'll come to the second years. See you all in five minutes. Yeah. Thank you.
All right, welcome everybody, welcome back. Uh, so now we are starting into the second year subjects. So this is introduction to game design, uh, at least second year for the Bachelor of Science Games Development. This is also an elective subject throughout UTS and it had about 200 people in it this semester. Um, but I think everyone in this group is from the Bachelor of Science Games Development, right? So you're all, yep, correct. You're all gonna have Jamie next year. So it's gonna be exciting. I'm oh, looking forward to it. <laughs> <laughs> so this is Vampirate. Um, and yeah, I'll let you guys take it away and describe the game. All right, so um, we are four of the creators of Vampirate. Uh, Vampirate is a top-down shooter um, where you play as a vampire pirate, hence the name. Um, and the, the whole premise of the game is that he, has, he was bitten by a bat or something, and he basically became a vampire, and now he's being mutinied by his crew, and he wants revenge. So um, we're going to have David here uh, demonstrating the game for you. Um, and while Baxter and Christian and I, we talk about some of the, um, different design elements we went through and how we kind of built the game. So Christian, I think the original idea was yours. So do you want to talk about how we originally came up with the idea for the game? Um, yeah, so just find it really fun to just simply go in and just shoot things like click on the pixels and stuff. Like you can't go wrong. Um, nothing too complicated. Don't want any um yeah over the top instructions just casually go in and have fun um i play a lot of games like that so like dead cells um nuclear throne uh streets of rogue that kind of stuff so i thought yeah let's try and make a, a shooter uh a lot of the games that people were making were um side scrollers and platformers so i wanted to try and make something different and we came up with this game so yeah yeah um oh, are we having issues Demonstrating it, right? Oh, there we go. All good. All good. So the first level is set in the beach after he's just been cast off the ship or something. Um, and basically, we have, well, we do have a tutorial level which teaches you like the fundamentals of the rage bar system and how and like how to shoot and all that sort of stuff. Um, but because we had to come up with five different mechanics, um, like it, sorry. It, mechanic each and then build a level around it we have our own small tutorial card um at the start of each level to explain how to use the mechanic um those were mostly done by david the excellent animations and everything um so in this first level this is christian's level and mechanic and the, the idea is that the dead enemies kind of leave a kind of a bit of a toxic pool of blood which stops um rage from uh like slowly degenerating um Rage system. This this was kind of my idea, but um, I thought I thought what what like how would it work if we had our um our XP for our um like progressing through the level as well as our health bar system and and our stamina for all our mechanics. What if we all tied that to the same value? Like how how would that change how a player would normally approach this sort of a game? So um, oh, he's, we're on iceberg now. This was uh, David's level. Um, and his mechanic was a dash, which kind of let, lets you, well, there we go, jump over water and as well as jump through enemies and kill them instantly. Um, like, that was, do you want to talk about that at all, David, or are you too busy concentrating? Um, <laughs> as I'm here. Nah. Yeah, he's trying not to die at the moment. Yeah. Um, so, so with David's level, when he uses dash, you can see in the bottom left, the rage actually decreases a bit. Um, so that's how, like how we kind of balance the game with your mechanics. Your mechanics um, just kind of make your rage bar decrease, and if your rage bar hits zero, you'll actually die. Um, but yeah, David's done really well this level. You can dash across the icebergs and stuff. Yeah, so that, that was, but like normally you can't. So um, this next level was Baxter's. So I think Baxter. Um, came up with the best mechanic and level design based around it. It's a it's a phase. So basically, you can there are certain walls in the game um, just to prevent to prevent boundary breaking and the like. But it, it lets you phase through walls and like sneak up on enemies and quickly get around the map and to like get an advantage on them. Um, I don't know. Do you want to talk about how you came yeah. up with that? Sure. So I just kind of wanted to make this more of a compact level where it's more about survival. We have to you have to use the mechanic to get around so say an enemy's not going to spawn right on the player so you actually sometimes have to go through the walls 
um, and you can link that pretty well with David's dash mechanic to get to across the map as quickly as you want, sneak up behind enemies, um, and of course it uses rage, so David's just died there. But um, yeah, do you want to go to jungle, David? Yeah, so um, jungle jungle was my level, and um, while I think I. I spent more time developing the mechanic more, but more so than the level around it. Um, my mechanic was basically taking the enemy a um, pathfinding and shooting AI, which um, Christian helped me with. Uh, we basically took that and then flipped it around so you could. Oh, is it stuck on loading? No. Okay. Oh, well. Um, I don't so... know what's happening here. Uh, hang on. Sorry, oh. guys. I think we're running out of time now. Oh. Ah. <laughs> Oh, I really... love the multi-purpose de design, like that mechanic of having a, an a energy bar plus a health bar as the same thing. Great idea. Oh, thank you. Yeah, pretty cool. Okay, well, thank you guys so much for this game. It's oh, really interesting cool. and looking forward to having you guys in Game Design Studio 1 next year. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> See you then, Jason. Just as a reminder, again, we're starting the new round of voting, so a new subject. If you haven't voted for the previous subject, please do, but there's a new round of voting. Um, so you can, after we get to our next break, you can vote uh, for all these games. Um, but the voting links are in the YouTube uh, description as well. All right, uh, we'll switch over to the next game. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank Cheers. You. Thank you. Cheers. Um, welcome back, guys. This is Heavy Metal by um, these guys from Introduction to Game Design. So take it away, guys. Yep. Uh, so Heavy Metal is a, it's an arcade-style hack and slash where you basically take control of a stick man with a very big sword and fight your way through waves of enemies. Um, we're just going to have a quick demonstration here. So the sword is controlled either by the mouse or by the right stick. Um, with the mouse, you get a bit more movement. With the right stick, you can use controller. We do have full controller input. I've just I have a controller here as a backup. Full controller input, so it works on all consoles as well. And um, it's more the video that's going to be taking this away. Sorry. Okay. Where, where are the enemies? Okay, here we go. So, um, throughout the game, uh, throughout the gameplay, you're going to have enemies spawning in, and they'll be denoted by their red color or more magenta. And have, we have various styles of them. So what you saw here were the floating cubes, which would come up from the top of the screen and try to swarm you. Um, from the bottom, we have the turtles, which kind of roll towards you. They're a bit bigger. And we have these rollers, which are, as you can see, they're white on one side, which makes them immune. The goal of the game is... Oh, so we'll jump into the arena real quick, is to survive each arena using whatever abilities uh, you gain uh, throughout gameplay. Now... By default, you'll always have your sword swing, and as you play, you'll unlock a jump, which will be on a cooldown, and you'll also unlock a slow motion, which will allow you to slow down time for a moment to get a better gauge of situations. Um, as well, later on, you'll unlock an ability called the sword dash, which will allow you to charge up your sword and dash forward, um, launching you across the screen. Now, as you saw there, there was another en another unique enemy. It was the symbol of floating cube uh, that fades in white, which means that it's immune for a time, and it requires you to use your slow motion. As you progress through the game, the enemy types are introduced sequentially. So um, enemies like the partially invincible cube uh, will come up on level slow motion, uh, encouraging you to use that levels introduced mechanic to deal with them. Um, each arena is made up of five waves. 
Um, and once all the enemies in a wave are defeated, there's a small delay, which you can collect yourself in, and then the next one spawns immediately afterwards. Now, uh, very importantly, there are three sort of difficulty modes to the game. You've got oh, the normal... Oh. So, Sorry, um, I think um, we'll just go to the um, final level, because that has all the mechanics. Um, yep. Uh, as, you saw, as you saw briefly there, oh, we'll pull them up in a moment, oh, yeah, okay, to right. play the game. Uh, you've got normal, where every time you clear a wave, you regain all of your health. You've got classic, which you only regain your health at the end of each level. Or you have hardcore, which you die in one hit, and I am not very good at that one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm going to jump into normal mode. Um, yeah. As well, before each level, before a mechanic is introduced, you get a little tutorial area like this. I'll just so, full screen it so it's more professional. Yep. You get a little <laughs> tutorial like this. So you run over the mechanic to unlock it, and it'll give you a bit of a prompt to use it. So click left mouse to drag and dash, and you do that sort of ability. And then you can combine the abilities together to um, create interesting strategies and that sort of thing. Like that. Um, stuff like the sword dash with the jump allows you to have like a huge amount of airtime, allowing you to avoid ground-based enemies. Um, providing more and more strategies as you go throughout the game. As of right now, we have four arenas, uh, five including the tutorial, and with each arena, you'll have more and more enemies, more and more variety of enemies, and more deadly enemy combinations, more enemies which will attack you while invincible, meaning you'll have to work for your timing more, more enemies which will attack from the ground, so you'll need to maximize your airtime, and so on and so forth. Uh, strategies which players will figure out as they play. Now. Um, there's not really much else otherwise. It's more, it's a lot of um, less thinking, more action. You'll need, definitely need to work in the moment. You're being swarmed by enemies, especially if some of them are invincible at times. It's going to be a bit difficult uh, to concentrate if you're constantly thinking about each move. You're going to be really in the moment when you play. And it does get pretty uh, overwhelming. I'm making it look easy because I've played it the most, but... <laughs> um... There are moments when it gets quite stressful. <laughs> I'll openly say we had a um, event just the other week where we had some high school students in uh, doing some intro courses with UTS and they were getting a taste for Unity and in order to show them what kind of was possible, we showed them this and they were going haywire with it. It was just a whole room full of high school students. <laughs> really... On oh. the next wave of enemies, sorry to interrupt here. The next wave of enemies, when the partially invincible cubes come in, can you use the slow-mo to uh, get that window of invincibility? So which know. one? The, the half, the like, on-off cubes things? Uh, the on-off cubes, yes. Okay. Excellent. Thank you, guys. That's a really cool game. I like I like the simplistic uh, visuals, and I like how heavy the thing looks. Actually, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not playing. The board but I think feels heavy. It gives, <laughs> you, it gives you that. Yeah, I, the original yeah. idea was that the. Sorry, what did you want me to do, Artemy? I just used that slow mo to get that invincibility period removed. There you go. Cool. Just a bit of a um, show off. There. Yeah, the original idea was that. Um, oh, this is a hard bit. Um, Chosen a bad time to start talking. Um, the yeah. original idea was that the sword would get heavier as you played, so it got harder. Mm -hmm. But we figured out that it just felt better to have the sword at consistent, satisfying weight. And um, we now actually just let you set it as a sensitivity option. Um, yeah. Oh, do you mind dying yeah. here real quick just to show off what the <laughs> game yeah. is? I'm going to have to move on to the next one. So, yeah. I'm to keep it on time. Okay. All right, thanks everybody thank for hosting us. Yeah, thank you guys. Thank, thank you, so you guys. No worries.
Okay. Yeah. Now I'd like to introduce our next game, Ever Changing. Yeah. Oh. So, all right. right. So, <laughs> right. Uh, so, Ever Changing. Um, so, first of all, I am Jeffrey, and the person playing the game is Francisco, who we just want to say hello quickly. What's up? Yeah. Uh, you'll see a bit of him later as well. But uh, for this project, uh, I was the uh, lead designer for the mechanics, and Francisco uh, headed the programming of the game. Um, the concept of our game was that is well the two well the way that our project worked is that we had two words we had to, two themes and we could pick two, and the things that we picked were uh, leveling uh, leveling up makes you weaker and adapt evolve overcome, and the way I interpreted that is uh, every single time you level up or in this in our case speed a level. Um, one of your abilities get changed. So something that's harder to use, but has unique strengths uh, in comparison. Um, I, that's the, the reason I found that idea is compelling is because in a lot of games I found that, a lot of games I found that um, the strongest ability, the, the seemingly easiest to use abilities had ish, also have a very inbuilt weakness. And that meant that the best moves weren't the ones that initially appeared the strongest. And that's the idea I decided to play off of for this. So. Starting with, as you can see, melee uh, is a, got bound, as we call it. Um, it went from a simple attack, which you can just spam over and over, to something which you have to time. So the way it works is that if you just try to spam it, um, friends, if you just want to try to try spam it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it just doesn't do much damage. It's an incredibly weak attack. It goes far, yeah, but it's not going to kill much with it. Um, but if you, uh, if, if you actually use it, time it, uh, you can get increased damage. So it demands more from you. It demands more attention. It demands more, fo it demands more uh, mental, uh, it's like sort of fortitude and focus. But in exchange, you can actually do just as well, if not better than what you had before. And hence, you have, by adapting and evolving, you can overcome the challenges which the game gives you. Um, as for the actual core mechanic of the game, uh, there are two. Th there is both your own health and the health of two obje of objectives. Uh, the and each of the enemies, which are color coded, will have different behaviors uh, to deal to attack either. So red enemies will always go towards you. They're fast and they'll just chase you down. And the blue and en blue enemies will go towards you directly to the objective. Yellow enemies uh, shoot projectiles and. Having that color coding means that we can introduce new enemy types and you will immediately know what they do. Um, so if you see new, uh, so later there'll be red enemies which you'll see that are smaller, like mini red enemies, and you will immediately be able to tell that they are going to go after you. Um, We've the, got a question in the chat, guys. Uh, what was yeah. this game inspired by? Um, it was inspired by one specific game, um, but Basically, my experience with the, all the games which I've played, where once again the cheese abilities, the easiest ones to use are are usually the best, and I just sort of wrote, flew, just made the entire concept off of that idea. Yeah. Um, also, uh, to interject, sorry, but uh, shout out to Jordan. Uh, he also gave us the inspiration. Uh, mentioned that the games was inspired by Hades, so shout out to Jordan. Yeah. Thanks, Jordan. Um, and yeah. I have to say, Francisco uh, so, is doing really well. When I played this, I sucked <laughs> oh you, you don't know how much you i played this i i, I, I kind of want to when i was like uh actually building up based on jeffrey's um game design i kind of want to make the game kind of hard uh intentionally just because i think that kind of makes for a more engaging uh kind of combat yeah uh, so this actually kind of goes into like the way i've actually designed the moveset and there's the red enemies i was talking about earlier uh, um the small ones but the way i designed the moveset is that each specific ability covers one sort of thing you want you want in a fight so the your main melee ability covers the direct interaction with the objective, which is to kill the enemies. You want to kill the enemies, so that directly interacts with that. However, um, that's not going. That also ha doesn't really control space very well. And this is and we did create like a need for that by including these, these defense objectives, which because you can't cover the entire space at once, you need a way to control space. So to make sure that there's no, there's little overlap there, I there the. Um, the second ability is called the Disable, is designed to control space. So you need to constantly juggle already these two. And on top of that, um, 
to, to control your own space, not just enemy space, there's your know, dash, and it just, and basically the, the entire design philosophy I had for creating the moveset was everything has its own unique purpose, which, which covers the weakness of another move. So this leaves that room for uh, skill growth where you learn how to best use each of these individual abilities to cover each other. Right, so it's all a lot of juggling at once. You can't rely on one specific, one single thing, and that's really one one of the key things I wanted to focus on, making sure yeah, you definitely. can't rely on one single thing. Yeah, uh, synergy. Like uh, during our playtesting, we really wanted to make sure that the synergy between each ability was uh, actually you know, done. People were using multiple abilities at the same time. Um, yeah. That was kind of a big like big one for the game because I think again, uh, I think combat is pretty much what makes it fun is choices and movement. And, you know, I think that was kind of our idea for the game, is to kind of combine both. So the bindings will give you, like, choices, and then the they would also inherently give you kind of that movement as well. Yeah. And awesome. Sorry, guys, we're going to have to end there so that we can jump over to the next one. Um, but, right. yeah, that's Thank nice to hear so, many, so much you. thought gone into the design. So yeah. very well done. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Good job. All right, uh, so this is a little bit different, this one. Uh, so the first assessment in Intro to Game Design is actually to build a board game rather than a digital game. So the first half of the semester, for those of you that have done it, you'll know this. And for those of you that are thinking of doing it, uh, you build a board game, you test out those design skills, those brainstorming skills in making a board game before you dump, uh, jump into Unity and make a different game. So you start from scratch in Unity later on for the second half of the semester. Now we were going to have a few more of these board games available in the physical showcase and they would have been fun to play around with because you always end up with a whole bunch of people just yelling at each other across good board games uh, mm. within the room. Uh, so unfortunately that couldn't happen but one of our board game game groups um, is still going to talk about their design and how they put it together and this was probably one of my favorites uh, out of the uh, out of all the ones that I played within my uh, labs this year um, so yeah go for it awesome so uh, we created a board game called Mafia Wars so it's a three to four player board game which is basically derived of the game chess which everyone knows but with guns and so uh, our main concern was building a board that had enough to fit four-player games and three-player players, but in a balanced arena. So as you can see here on our right now, there's five different sections. So as a four-player, you pick the four on the sides, and then when it's to three-player, then you've got the top one, but and you leave the other two out. So everything's balanced. All the guns are in the balanced spot, so everyone's always an equal distance away from the same amount of guns. So right now we have a game in the background, which Alyssa amazingly created over the past two days. So it's actually a recreation of our game, but made online. Um, it's, this, it's a tabletop simulator so that you can watch and play the game as if you're playing it live, but online. So I can see Alyssa is making her first turn right now. Everyone's always an equal distance away from the guns. And the first start can be quite important depending on what gun you go for so right now we have a sniper in the middle so there's only one sniper in the game and to make this sniper balanced it's required to have only a line of sight so as you can see from this diagram here it demonstrates which angles from the middle that the sniper can move um and that's that for the sniper uh for the guns you have an area of two blocks to shoot someone from so someone's going to get a gun soon and he'll be able to shoot someone which is two blocks away. So each turn you can either decide to move forward to another gun or uh, have an attack turn. 
So once we get further into the game, we'll find someone to shoot. And then we can demonstrate how to keep the game moving forward. So with the guns, once you shoot someone, you have to move within one block towards the player that you shot. Soon we'll get that right now between pink and red, hopefully. Um, or they will challenge for the sniper. Because sniper at the, in the middle cannot always be the most balanced. Because the sniper has a minimum range of two blocks. So you can only shoot someone that's in the line of sight or over two blocks away. And furthermore, um, you can't shoot through people. So if you have your own goon in front of you and you want to shoot the person behind the goon, you can't shoot them because you, you have to go through your own goon first. Um, Another mechanic we have is the dons. So at the do you can see the three dons we have currently right now. They are the mo they're basically the kings from the chest. So your dons are the most important thing to protect and you at all costs, basically. Because if you kill an enemy's don, you get the rest of the other person's goons. And that can uh, be Nick, a major advantage. do you mind advantage. if I jump in for a quick second? Yeah, go for it. Uh, if you guys can see in the middle here, uh, my name's Ayush, by the way, playing as pink. Um, Anderson is two spaces away from me. I have a pistol. It is currently my turn. So I'm deciding to kill his piece because he is two spaces away and that is the range of the pistol. And after each uh, attacking turn, if you have the pistol, you have to move one space towards whichever player you killed. So that is happening over there. Uh, continue on, Nick. All right. Sorry, guys. We've got to wrap up pretty soon i know it's, no. it's they, these board games are designed to be played over 50 minutes not in, in five <laughs> yeah. um but I, I really wanted to highlight and well done putting this on tabletopia I, I don't know if we have the link on the showcase website but if if we don't please send it to us so that we can upload um it. there is a link on our itch page at the top okay i'll, okay. I'll just show it right here yeah if you just awesome. click there you can just go to a new lobby and then job done great that's That'd really cool fun. Fantastic doing that in just like two days since we told you that all this was happening. Um, but yeah, yeah, I just wanted to say, to Alyssa. yeah, the, the, the reason why I really like this game, and it's hard to tell in this short preview, but the way the mechanics work with the board layout is just amazing when you're actually playing it and you're actually trying to win and think, because usually what you end up do, you're doing is at the moment, all the characters are just moving one unit at a time. But when I was playtesting it, everyone was moving multiple and you've got all your units kind of covering each other from different angles and you end up in so many situations where it's like oh i could take out that person but then they'll take out me and then that person will take it out so you end up with these chain reaction of events happening um and yeah it, it was something that was just kind of glorious to play i so. remember correctly will uh, you set up a pretty good trap <laughs> trapping yeah. both another player's don and then two goons from a, a different player so that was really really cool I may not have the skill for the, the reflexes for some of the digital games anymore, but I hope I've still got the brain to outsmart some of you with a board game. Yes, All with right. guns. Didn't know I yeah. needed it, but I want it now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you very, very much, everyone. Um, Thanks yeah, so much. Uh, thank you. We'll jump over to the right. next one. Have a good day. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you, guys. Um, welcome back. Um, this is Apartment Mysteries um, by these wonderful folks. Um, they have a trailer to start us off, so um, take it away.
pretty good. So do you want do one of you guys want to talk about your game and what inspired you um, in this? Okay, so uh, this is our little detective inspired game. It's more narrative reliant than anything, but basically we use the prompts from our uh, subject guidelines and we basically uh, got a very mystery slash uh, detective vibe from two of the prompts that we uh, had seen and that was basically to discover the truth about something. So we kind of based a little murder mystery game around these prompts. And basically, uh, you start off in a little hallway and uh, the tutorial level guides you towards the first room in the apartment block and you can go around and by pressing F to interact with your surroundings, there's a lot of little gimmicks and objects that you can kind of examine and this is basically how you derive the plot of the murder mystery. Yeah, so I'm um, currently... Well, the play is in the hallway, but there are four different rooms. Um, this is the first room, Bread, so the neighbor is called. Uh, we've each implemented a new mechanic to progress the plot somewhat. So this would be the lockpicking stage. And... Well, we'll see here that neighbor one's actually not home. Um, the murderer is actually one of the uh, one of these neighbors, and there is an accomplice, which you have to figure out as well while listening to the dialogue and figuring out all the hints. Uh... So, uh, I know that there's a. There's some artists on the team. I definitely know Nina's capabilities. Uh, <laughs> yep. Is this original artwork in here? Uh, yep, so uh, hand animated the little avatars. There were a few assets that I borrowed, um, such as all the little tables and the um, the little wardrobes. But um, yeah, most of the background art uh, I did in Photoshop. Very nice. So the, the character mm -hmm. animations are your own as well, are they? Uh, yeah, <laughs> little sprite that's, sheets. That's really cool. They're Thank very you. charismatic for essentially just two-toned characters. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, has a lot of character for not much character, you could say. <laughs> <laughs> and and the audio, is that uh, uh asset from online as well, or is someone in here? Yeah, that was royalty-free music. Okay. Awesome. It fits the game really well. <laughs> So how, I might have missed it, but how do the levels progress? Like, does the, is there a challenge curve that increases or does it get a little bit more complicated or is it mostly focused on the narrative? Uh, it's mostly focused on the narrative, but basically um, it could be said that there's a challenge curve. Um, so basically each room introduces a new little mechanic. So the first one that we had was the uh, picking the lock, our second one was using the notebook. If you pressed Q, you could link up different Q, uh, clues. And basically from that room onwards, you would be using your notebook to kind of figure out the plot of what happened. So it's kind of like you derive the plot from the elements that you examine in the game levels. And the levels are just uh, the doors labeled uh, zero to four. So zero is a tutorial level and each room is basically a level of its own. And the hallway is your level selection screen. Very cool. Nice. We have to head off to the next game, but I thought I would just point out that uh, in the YouTube chat, um, our head of the interaction design and games discipline, Andrew Johnson, said his uh, daughter is playing the game at the moment and is loving it. So that is a, I think, <laughs> big seal of approval. <laughs> so, Wonderful. Thank you very much. Congratulations, all. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys.
Okay, now we're moving swiftly on to Into the Core. Um, you guys take it away. Yeah, nice to meet you. I'm Michael, and this is Into the Core. So Into the Core is a top-down stealth game with some puzzle elements. Um, as for inspiration, we, we, we mainly drew inspiration from those old Flash games, those old stealth Flash games on... Um, there's websites like Arm Games, where uh, it, where where enemies have a cone, and uh, <laughs> uh, we we also drew inspiration from Payday Two. Uh, cash Pro. <laughs> yeah, it's gameplay. gameplay sorry, yeah. uh, I guess I'll I'll let Kenny take over from now. But basically, we've got two two difficulties. Easy and hard. Um, originally, we started with uh, no difficulty, so the base game was just um, what is now the hard difficulty. But we had to add the, the easy difficulty in later. All right. Uh, yeah, I'd just leave it to Kenny now. Or oh, Michael. Be Michael. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, hey, uh, I'm Michael. I design level one. This level you're watching right now. Uh... I guess I should just say that uh, for every level we introduce a new, uh, I guess, sort of enemy and this introduces the security camera. So uh, just the single things just spinning around on the in the middle and the bottom right are the security cameras. And uh, this, is, this is designed to just ease the play into the game because it's the uh, level that immediately comes after the tutorial level. So it shouldn't be too hard. Uh, but anyways, you sort of have to uh, skillfully time the uh, cameras into where you can uh, sneak into little gaps and so that you don't get detected. Um, yeah, this game, this level should be pretty easy because it's the tutorial level and it's sort of designed to ease the player into level two. Uh, and I didn't design this, Kenny designed this. and. Yeah, I guess I'll let him take it away. Yep, so my name's Kenny. I designed uh, level two. So in this level, it's a little bit hard to see, but uh, I in we introduced the combination door for this level. So if you see at the end of the level there, the door has like three separate colors. So that's to indicate that uh, each console will unlock a uh, part of the door. So once you uh, activate all three consoles at the door unlocks. So this is like uh, so in our design process, we since we designed like a puzzle game, we found out that uh, we wanted to introduce some contradictions, right? Logical contradictions to our game. So compared to level one, right? We when you activate the console, we just open the door. But in this level, when you first activate the console at the start of the level, you realize that it doesn't automatically open the door. So we kind of leave it to the player to solve <laughs> the mechanics of the level. So I'll leave uh, Makuru to talk about this level. Um, this level was designed by, I think, Tung, I think it was. Uh, he couldn't join us today, unfortunately. But um, so levels one and two were just rather simple uh well compared to us i don't know about the skill level of anyone watching uh but levels three and four and probably five take a very steep and sharp um level of difficulty um which which was a problem because these games were designed to last around i think it was 20 minutes otherwise we'd have to force it to stop and uh well previously in our play tests we had uh, everything that we ever had in just this one level and it took too long to try and solve it uh, so we have to go through some design iterations where we just made it a lot more simpler than it than we really hoped uh, if you yeah is that level four oh, it's three yeah I just switched to to the easy easy difficulty so with the easy difficulty uh those gold little coins in the scattered throughout the game in easy to, in easy mode uh, act as checkpoints. So, yeah, if you get caught by that security camera, you get 
restarted at that last uh, coin that you've captured. Nice. And yeah. Let's quickly go over the next few levels then. So uh, I'll talk about the difficulty of the yeah. levels. So this level in particular is like very, <laughs> very difficult on hard mode. I think uh, of everyone that's played, I think maybe like maybe three people, or like maybe 40 people are able to do it. And this is because this level introduces two logical contradictions. And it's not clear at the start level uh, where they are present. But I think uh, like for stealth games, I think finding them out is like part of the fun, part of the challenge. Right. But uh, if you are still struggling, there is easy mode, so there are checkpoints. But hard mode is the true experience, so I recommend playing that difficulty. So, of course, right. naturally, I, I play it on easy mode for sure. <laughs> <laughs> so, when you switched on easy mode, did you find a lot more of the playtesters were able to make it through and find those logical uh, contradictions? Yeah. yeah. Very nice. I believe we need to move on now. Um, but thank you for showing our yep. us your game, guys. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks for having thank us. Thank you very much. Thanks for having us. See you later. Thank you, guys. Oh, okay. So now I'd like to introduce Don't Kill Me. Called Don't Kill Them, sorry. Hi, so um, we wanted to make a game that would fit well into the themes of trust and betrayal, along with physics and primitives. Um, and after some discussion, we settled with a 3D physics-based puzzle idea, slightly reminiscent of Portal's puzzle-based nature, coupled with multiple character feature of games such as Fireboy and Watergirl. We really like the idea of co controlling multiple characters, which ties nicely into our theme um, while keeping a puzzle-based approach to our levels. In other words, we wanted the player to be an all-powerful entity that was capable of controlling the fates of the characters with the only goal in mind, to eliminate all red characters while keeping at least one blue character alive. And that is how we came up with Don't Kill Them. Yeah. Uh... So yeah, the, the basic mechanic of this game is, oh, oops, uh, uh, you can uh, switch between players and enemies to control them. Uh, and yeah, so yeah, uh, the goal is to kill all the red enemies. Um, uh, yeah, um, and, and we have, um, yeah, one of the main mechanics we have is bards, which uh, can both uh, switch these these trapdoors, and also uh, anything from lasers to mirrors, as you'll see later. Um, yeah. So the way that um, our game functions is that every single level there is a brand new mechanic that gets introduced. So in um, our tutorial stage, um, the player was first introduced to the concept of buttons. Um, and in this stage, level one, um, you, the player gets introduced to um, trapdoors, 
which are controlled by the buttons as well. And as I said, the goal is to eliminate all of the red players, but it is in a more puzzle-based um, mindset that you do have to approach this. I think um, something that was quite important in development is we wanted to make sure we didn't want to paint the red people as enemies. We almost wanted to paint them as like individuals. And we wanted to make... Um, originally, we were going to make our game so that the more blue people you saved, the higher your score was, but you didn't have to save all the blue people to figure out the puzzles. I know in some of the earlier puzzles, like this one, it's you have to... The only way to solve it is to save both blue people, but some of the later ones, I'm pretty sure, you could choose to save blue ones or kill them to make the puzzle easier or harder to like kind of provide like a moral kind of like do i want to make this easier but kill some of my blue survivors kind of thing yeah and, and also some of them you have to keep uh some of the uh, uh some of the players alive um to be able to finish them. So once you had the mechanics in mind, what was your process for kind of designing each of the puzzles? Was you brainstorm them as a group or did you design them individually? Yeah, yeah we kind of went off individually. For example, so I did the first level. I kind of just did it at home, um, messing around with um, Unity and all the tools, trying to create something that looks like a, um, that worked for the play tests in the lab. Um, and once we got something that worked and people could actually understand it, we kind of just stuck with that. And we all did a level separately. We didn't really do them together. Uh, and... well, 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 we did uh, uh, brainstorm the ideas uh, for, for each of the mechanics. Yeah. Oh, yeah, for the mechanics, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, and we all came up with them together. And I think that, yeah, we kept those same mechanics that we uh, just brainstormed in one of the first meetings. Um, Kind of, kind of expanded on some levels. Uh, uh, yeah. So yeah, we did have a very rigorous process to iterate and iterate and make sure that each of these levels were, um, I guess, good enough to include in the game because it is mainly just about the levels. And if we have poor level design, then the game doesn't shine at all. So it was very important for us to make sure that our levels were were good and weren't just linear but not too difficult. Cool. Thank you, guys. I think that's all we have time for now. Yeah. Cool. Unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Really tricky. But once again, feel free to, ju to jump, jump online and play the games online. Like, we have them all available to you guys. Okay. Uh, the, the, this, this game is available online. Uh, yeah. Awesome. Fabulous. All right. Awesome. Cool. Thank you very much. We will move Thanks. Right Sorry, I had to cut you off. Yep. Okay, um, welcome back. This is Kitchen Nightmare. Um, take it away, guys. Nice. Uh, yeah, so we were the five people crew and we wanted to make a uh, Bennett Farley inspired esque platformer in which uh, follow the themes of uh, leveling up, uh, adapt, evolve, overcome, and a baguette. So we created this, uh, we created this platformer in which. Uh, the entire premise is that um, it's actually quite difficult to control. So at the start, it's just your average double jump and triple jump thing. But then as you go across, if I, you know, stop struggling as much, you unlock <laughs> the main weapon in the game, which is the spatula. 
So we introduced it very early on, just to get the players used to it. And then after the tutorial is done, we start forcing them to use it. So the spatula is going to be with you throughout the entirety of the game. You can't progress without utilizing it, and it's also very annoying to use. It's it's the only way to kill enemies, and you know, if you get hit, it's just like a quick reset. Uh, so we planned the game around the player struggling to overcome this new mechanic because everything else if you're not equipping the spatula your player is a lot easier to control you've got your triple jumps you've got movement and it's fine the second the spatula gets pulled out you're no longer moving to the side but instead you have to you have to utilize this giant stick uh we combine the <laughs> we combine the movement to incorporate how many spins you have with the spatula whenever you hit so some enemies require more spins to actually kill them so we actually there's going to be you're going to be switching in and off your forms just so you can a get very big maneuverability and then the second you're on your in the right place you go down and you slam and then yeah so at the start it's just as simple as getting up high enough to kill the enemies but then later we start introducing some new mechanics as i'll show in level four so over here uh, even though it's the stage starts as normal as others We incorporate jam which adds some maneuverability to your spatula even though it's still as hard to control Sorry <laughs> Sorry. So, oh yeah. So we, after adding maneuverability to the spatula as well, we're forcing the players to no longer stick to the single form, as the jumps are no longer possible with just the, your trip. So over here, where these giant arches above us, and over here, we have to use all the mechanics we've led to the player beforehand. So we've got the spatula and we've got a rebound. Though so these are just as unruly as the spatula itself. So we use the jam to allow players to control themselves and give, you know, give a bit more maneuverability midair and actually aim the, the path of the path of rebound. So guys, uh, I can ask you a question. How did you get inspired for this game? Uh, I think the biggest inspiration was Bennett Fordy's getting over it because he wanted to have a platformer which was difficult to control. Other than that, it's just not what you see. I can, yeah, yeah I can definitely see the inspiration. Yeah, uh, and then the epitome of the entire game was uh, teaching the player how to use each of the mechanics to face the final boss, which is where our final team comes in, and the play on word Kitchen Nightmare. Reset. So the point is, as we've shown to, or uh, as we've shown the player beforehand, you have to actually manage to hit the hit the enemies to kill them, and he's immune from above because the knife is protecting him. Uh. So we've got yeah, and the knife gates were introduced in level one. So the entire premise is kill all the enemies and then kill kill our good chef in the middle there. But uh, a simple issue is that you can just boost yourself up here and get a good hit in if you're lucky. Which I'm gonna try and do. But Not yeah. that you need to use all the mechanics to beat the final boss. Yeah, exactly. So I think my favorite part of the game is right here where you have to stick onto the damage platform, use it to boost yourself up, and then go through the platforms and kill that cabbage there. And you have to do the same thing on the right side, and then the knives will open up and you kill them. Just as simple as that. So. That would explain uh, why I just could not figure this level out. I didn't realize that's a Yeah, to, to we, we did me. struggle in uh, directing the player on exactly what to do, which is on mostly my end. I think more tutorial oh, no. points in the later no, levels. It, it's it's a really creative use of combining mechanics to launch yourself off the damage platform and then apply. Mm. Yeah, that's really good. Cool. Okay. Uh, cool. I think that's it. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Thank you, Thank guys. You. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you.
All right, uh, last one for this round, and this is rounding out the introduction to game design uh, games. So yeah, if you haven't voted, watch this one, then go click on the link in the YouTube description and vote for the series of games. This is Begettin' Over It, um, which we've been laughing about the title all the semester. Um, and yeah, a gorgeous game is what you're about to see. So go for it. Eddie and Crystal. Get it over it is well. We were we were supposed to pick between two themes, so other things we picked were it's a baguette and increasing discomfort with four bit color part as a sort of like bonus. So basically, um, the this main plot is that you are a baguette and you are trying to get to the Eiffel Tower in search of your soup mate. And the increasing discomfort part of it comes to the fact that um we have a dough system. So if you see in the top corner, we have three dough right now, but we, if you enter water, you get soggy, and that if you get too soggy, that breaks off part of your baguette. So the smaller you are, the more difficult it can be to climb, but it also sometimes makes it easier to get into smaller gaps. So there's a sort of like balance between that sort of stuff if you want to break off parts of yourself to, get in, to be able to access other places. <laughs> or if you want to stay like large so you can climb better. And as we can see, Eddie is having trouble trying to get past this, but oh, trust this is I remember, <laughs> I remember <laughs> Will had a lot of trouble on this, but yeah, there we yep, go. I did. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we have a... So, uh, the game... Yeah. The game's kind of difficult. Sometimes it's a little too difficult in later levels, but um, we wanted to kind of maintain optional difficulty with these secret collectibles. So like here, uh, I didn't even notice oh, those. They were there. I completely missed those challenges. Yeah. So like that, there's a tomato up there, and um, if you manage to get through this little passageway, which I normally would be able to, you can collect it. And if you collect them all, something special happens, but it's not very special. <laughs> it's Eddie's um, under dream pressure, you know. So it's not the best. Eddie's our best speedrunner for the game. Yeah, and. Uh, <laughs> The game's deciding to start it really badly today, so... A nice mixture of Discord. I'm gonna be banned with them. Yeah. Uh, so, um... I mean... Our initial... Ah, it's this part. Um... Yeah, our initial brainstorming was, um... We, we wanted to use, um... Edward's, uh... theme of It's a Baguette. We couldn't really think of a good way to use it, though. So we, um... Like the, the the initial pitch was like there would be a pigeon terrorizing you, and from there we started thinking about different ways you could have little mechanics mechanics that uh, branch off of this theme of being a baguette. So like here you can see that you can become soggy, and um, later there's like butter you can slide across. And there's also um, like fire that toasts you. But yeah, yeah, I, I, I really love how you took the idea of what is a baguette and what can a baguette do and it seems like a ridiculous question but you really pulled all the kind of yeah the shrinking and growing mechanics from that and that part before where you said it's this part and you kind of had to break down to get smaller to then get through the um the smaller gap i remember there was a whole bunch of people and i think even some people from the playmakers development team who said this is crazy and then they figured out what it was and everyone just has that aha moment of oh so getting smaller is actually a good thing at times it's not just a punishment i wasn't yeah, expecting and, um, a pigeon but it <laughs> looks good <laughs> so yeah we had oh. like for each level with different um different mechanics so we had the butter fire pigeon water and we also, I like, think uh, we're a little pressed we, for time, so I'm gonna skip to a little bonus level that we made. Yeah, we made this exclusively for the showcase. It wasn't in our original build. It was a scrapped idea, but um. But we're showing it for the yeah. showcase because it's great. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little boss fight. <laughs> and um, yeah. So like, I've also take into consideration oh I missed that completely um how your size would affect how you approach this battle so um if you uh, lose some mass become really tiny you can just walk straight under the pigeon but if um you're big enough and you're skilled enough you can actually just climb straight up him 
is. He also has different phases. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, game. Yeah. Fight gets uh, difficult over time and um, uses the uh, fire and water mechanics to try and stop you. Ah, uh, no. That's really nice. The fire that you basically added this instantly video. breaks off parts of you. Yeah, we get to see his final attack now. <laughs> oh. His eye laser. This was a fun one. <laughs> no. Yeah, as you can see, oh, it gets increasingly more just uncomfortable. So that like, this kind of like encapsulates the whole entire game in some wacky boss fight. Oh no! Oh, that was oh, a nice mistake. Fight. You're so close. <laughs> You've taken a wacky idea and just run with it, and it's gone wild, and it's absolutely brilliant for it. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So uh, um... I wanted to, I wanted to beat him so you could watch the end cutscene. Okay. So while you're doing anyway. that, uh, I'll keep playing in the background, and uh, yeah, I'll just say that uh, we do. Uh, again, this is the end of this section, so we're going to take another five minute break. We're going to come back and we're going to look at some more projects. So the projects coming up are more of our research projects. We've got animation projects. We've got projects from uh, our introduction to computer graphics subjects. So a lot of low level graphics programming going on there. Uh, and a few projects from our alumni and students working in Game Jam. So we've got a whole batch of things coming up next. Um, so we'll take a five minute break. Remember to vote for the games that you've just seen for introduction to game design uh, And this is just a little bit of sh shameless promotion um, So both uh, Krista and Eddie are in the Playmakers dev team this year So if you haven't heard of it Playmakers dev team is an extracurricular game development project uh, That we run every year and it's by uh, essentially you apply to get in and we uh, it can be for credit we can organize that but usually a lot of the team members are just doing it as an extra game to add to their portfolio eddie is our art lead which i'm really glad for um because yeah he's done an amazing job on this and i think it looks amazing um and krista is on his team helping him with it so yeah uh if you are interested in the playmakers dev team uh just ask me i can give you more information uh otherwise we'll probably be showing off the game from this year at the spring showcase at the end of the year if we can hopefully have it in person uh, otherwise you can check out the spring showcase from last year um, and we'll post the link in uh, YouTube in a moment just so that you can check it out and yeah you can see the, all the games from last year uh, from the spring uh, and including the Playmakers dev team game as well from last year so yeah take a five minute break and we'll come back soon
right, welcome back everyone. Um, I hope you guys managed to stretch your legs and get some water. Uh, we have around a whole bunch of uh, really cool projects and these are not games per se, games are uh, games, uh, projects per se, but these are really cool um, computer graphics stuff, 3D animation, and a whole bunch of subjects uh, related to what we do in the, uh, in the game stuff. So the next team, uh, it's from 3D animation, and we've got Joshua, Riley, Claudia, and Roy. Uh, guys, can you please show us your game? Sorry, your 3D animation team. Um, we've been working on our 3D animation project, Skirmish on the Storm and Sea. Um, so the subject basically takes you through the 3D animation pipeline. Um, it began as a storyboard and we learnt techniques in Unity, such as physics-based animations, inverse kinematics, rendering techniques and post-processing, um, which we put together to bring our story to life. Now we're excited to present to you Skirmish on the Storm and Sea. Take it away, Riley. Here we are. Uh, sorry guys, I think on the chat, uh, we've got, well, we can hear anything. No audio? Um. Feeling it's just a little bit quiet. Maybe either that, or it's not coming through because I've got my headphones out. Yeah. See if that helps. All good now. All good now. Good now. All good now. <laughs> There we are. So that was our animation. Yeah, that was awesome, guys. <laughs> yeah. That was really cool. Um, don't know if we have time, but I really want to ask you this question. Um, can you tell us about the process to make it all happen? Um, so process to make it, well, 
first we came up with a uh, short storyboard for what we wanted in that. Um, the assets to use, most of them we managed to have from a, a, a Unity package, uh, Unity pack that uh, Josh found. The water, though, um, we couldn't really find one, so we wanted to do. So I ended up uh, making my own water simulation type thing using layered Perlin noise for that and mm -hmm. learned scripts for the boats. So they all. That, that's uh, a fair effort problem. just to, to <laughs> get water. Going. Yeah. Really Turned out really nice. Good. But, um, yeah. And then sort of from the scenes, from the storyboard, split them all up, each take a few scenes. Um, and yeah, just all using in the one Unity project to end up quite so well. Were each of the group members in charge of different aspects? Like one person was handling character reading, one person handling lighting, one person handling environment, or um, was it all just kind of taking care of To an of extent, we so had like uh, prefabs of everything we wanted that we all sort of made, and then like, uh, like the starting scenes, say like Josh would do some of the starting scenes, uh, Rory would do uh some of the scenes where like the pirates going on the, onto the merchant ship or claude and i would do some of the battle scenes and so forth so we'd each take individual parts very yeah. nice nice i think that's all we have time for guys but thank you very much for presenting your graphics project yeah, very impressive mm. yeah, thank thank thanks guys thank you All right, uh, next up we have another project, another animation from 3D Computer Animation. Uh, this is the Daymare of Tobias Truman, and I always have trouble saying the Daymare. It, my brain <laughs> freaks out with it, um, but I really like the title, so go ahead. Okay, um, so we've got here... Um, oh, sorry, I'm getting feedback. Hang on. There we go. So I just had to turn off the... the uh, in there. Okay, so just going through the project. So we, yeah, our group, we had a bit of a brainstorming session, a bit like the other team, uh, trying to work out what we're going to come up with. Um, we, we, we worked very organically together. We, we each sort of had bits and pieces that we'd take, but we'd also all, uh, wanted to try out the different parts as well ourselves. So we all had a go at different pieces. One of the big things that we wanted to bring into this uh, project was the cinematic style. So we had a bit of... Um, Bit of a, I guess, a checklist of things that we wanted to include, um, but obviously trying to make them fit into the story as well. So some of those classic things like a Dutch tilt, uh, a, um, a dolly zoom, like the, some of the cool camera positionings and things like that, but also drawing from some um, cinema um, movies that we were inspired by, which was uh, sort of Pacific Rim and um, uh, Blade Runner and stuff like that. So we went for It's very moody, very uh, sort of dark and mysterious, but it's sort of uh, the story unfolds as we go. So I'll, I'll get into it now.
Uh, just to double check, there's no audio for this or they're sharing audio? Oh, there is audio, yep. So is it not coming through? I think it's with the Discord stream, you have to share the audio. Oh. Uh, we might have to just keep rolling with it for the moment. Um, so yeah, okay. feel free to talk over it if you'd like. Uh, okay, where's the... Quite a substantial cityscape you've got there in the background. Did you have to piece that all together yourself? We used an asset for that one, and yeah. uh, we sort of manipulated it to what we needed for the project. All right. Um, uh, Ruben, were you asking a question? I think your mic cut out from him there. Sorry. Okay, there it is. Nice. Very nice. <clears throat> That's really cool. Apologies about the audio. It does have a really cool uh, music track there at the end, which. Uh, of it heightens the impact of some of those the punches and things like that but anyway so i feel like in in a lot of the 3d animation uh videos animations i've seen in the past um there hasn't been as much uh, like fight scene choreography and i know that's a very specific skill set um to really sell a good fight scene so how did you find working with that uh we we found some uh, animations um online and um, we also then obviously had to, ma to match them um there was also some points we had to sort of we had the music going as well and sort of certain beats of the music so then we had to match them up as well so it was a little fiddling around with the timeline and the the music track to get it to work um and then obviously the slow-mo effect um that was a bit tricky to get exactly right but yeah a bit of bit of trial and error and um yeah just working it till it worked very nice. And if you had more time on it, what would be the next thing that you'd try to polish? Um, oh, you could you could do a bit more with it. I think we could probably fix some of the lighting. Um, we could probably fix some of the uh, extra effects as well. So we used a bit of pro post processing in there, but we wanted to do um, to see some more things as well to so sort of get that dreamscape feel at the start. Um, yeah, so there's probably a few things like that, just sort of nailing the um, the atmosphere a bit more. All right. Anyone else Fine. from the group? Right. So anyone else from the group want to talk about what we wanted to do? Maybe I think like we uh we try to like uh do a bit of camera like we uh we want to add more effect on the camera, but it just like uh the time as well last time uh so. Uh, for the choreography, is like I also like actually I want to add on something, but because uh, the limited of time as well. But actually everything is fine. I try to uh, combine like from the movement, like I saw in like a fight scene in some movies as well. So yeah, actually that's all, I guess. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we have to move along, but yeah, that was very good. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, thank you guys. Thank you.
Okay, so now we're moving on to a different subject, but same voting pool. Um, is this is computer graphics projects? So um, this is Earth six one six. Um, take it away, guys. Okay, thank you. Hi everyone. So this is Galaxy Construction Company. Uh, we are glad to join this event. Uh, we are a team of two good programmers. Our project is a three D web application made with this three JS using uh, WebGL. Uh, we simulate the plant tree system and natural or nat unnatural landscape on different planets. So you will drive an UFO to explore in the solar system. Um, and during this exploration, you may interact and fall into different scenes on some of the planets, uh, such as uh, alien base and stormy world or island. And besides, we also create a scene generator. Uh, you can use JSON file to configure the scene and load them automatically. And now, let me introduce my teammate, Eugenio, to give us a demonstration. Hello, everyone. So this is the main scene of our uh, mission Zen. It's a solar system, and we have a UFO that we can drive to explore it. As you can see, there are nine planets uh, that move around the sun, and there are thousands of those stars floating in the space, and sometimes a few meteorites will appear. And we can use our mouse and keyboards to to control the UFO. And if we want to move to a place uh, quickly, we can click the place that we want to move. For example, if I want to go to the Mars, I can click the planet. And since it's a virtual museum, so the UFO will have some reactions to the collision, but it will not be destroyed. And there are a few Grand scenes that are hiding in some of the planets. For example, this one that are hiding in the Earth is called Island. So if you want to go to the branch scene, you can click the Earth and chase it for five seconds. And then you will be redirected to the this branch, uh, branch scene called Island. So it describes an island on the sea. Yes, uh, stars on the sky, moon, and sometimes a few meteorites will appear as well. So this is the water. You can see the reflections and waves on the water. On the island, there's a white tower. An old house. And a person. So let me make the UFO smaller too, so we can see the person more clear. So person will have some reactions to our UFO when we hide behind this person. She will do some pretty fine actions. But if we suddenly appear in front of her, she will be startled at first, and then she will start at our UFO. And sometimes she will wave her hands to us. So if we want to go back to the solar system, we can simply fly to the sky or click the moon. We can then we will be go back to the solar system. That's a a lot of work in three JS. Um, yeah, a lot of low level programming to get that working. <laughs> It, it, and it's also even the, the small things like how did you find doing the reflections on the water? Actually, the 3GS has integrated the water uh, object. Didn't yeah. that. That's cool. And there's an, uh, another thing that uh, is connected to the Jupiter, so we can play with the Jupiter and wait for five seconds. So this, this is stormy world. We have clouds, we have rains, and lightnings. So does every planet have its own little surface area? No, so far we only have uh, like four, four brain scenes. They were yeah. So it really yeah, shows they have different a, styles. <laughs> oh yeah, a wide range of skills showing different atmospheres and lighting effects yeah. and, and yeah, ground effects and so forth. That's fantastic. Yeah, really good job. It looks brilliant.
just for you guys watching yeah, at home, you. just to give you a bit of background, these these guys did this like from scratch. Every single aspect of the of the project was made uh, from scratch. So yeah, as I was saying, 3JS. So if you don't know 3JS, it's essentially uh, an extension on top of WebGL, which is just above normal GL. Uh, OpenGL. So yeah, this is all low-level coding. It's not uh, asset placing in a game engine or something like that. It's all, uh, yeah, a lot of work. Yeah, and purely kind of so And for thing. about 12 weeks, uh, yeah. just <laughs> one semester long. This is a lot of work for one semester, <laughs> that's for sure. So. <laughs> yeah, nice. so yeah, force field effect as well. Very nice. That's fantastic. Well done. Well, we might have to move along, but congratulations on quite a lot of effort. That's very impressive, Puff. Thank you. All right. Thank you, guys. Okay, guys, so now we have another uh, project from Computer Graphics. Once again, this is made in 3GS, and this is really hardcore stuff. Um, so the game or the project is 3D Chess. It's a, as you can see immediately on the screen, it is a fully functioning chess game. Um, you can play black, you can play white. Everything you could see in chess, you'd be able to play here. Um, you also have various time limits for the game modes. So, for example, right now we've got 3-Minute Blitz Chess. Each player has three minutes. Every time you take a move, swaps to the other player, turns it around. Now, it may just be a normal 3D chessboard here. If you see on the top right hand of the screen, you'll be able to see various controls for scenes, settings, the board, and so on. So if we quickly just open up lighting, uh, we'll be able to change the overall lighting effect on the board. Um, it's not as interesting as, for example, if we move on to background really quickly. Each background um, has a fully changes the scene, has the full background there. If we quickly do a, a rotation, you'll be able to see that it's a um, it's a six-sided skybox, and you'll be able to move it around there. When you change the background, it'll also change the preset lighting if you have the option enabled. So you'll be able to have uh, the full screen change with whatever background you want. Now, um, scene and lighting is great, but each additional chess piece as well can be customized if you go if we see the piece settings there on the side you'll see you have we have tech classic textures and we also have flower textures for everything uh fabric textures as well each individual piece color for the team can also be customized so if you don't like the black against white you can go checkers colors you can go uh flowery blue against uh fabric green um additionally the tiles on the board can also be changed if you like that little bit of um, variety. Now, um, as well as the visuals, it is, once again, a fully functioning chess game. <laughs> yeah, I think you can set black against black as well if you want to have complete confusion. <laughs> <laughs> you really can. <laughs> um, now, like, it is also... Hints fully... If you're playing? Sorry? Do you get hints like, on how to move, like how to make the... Yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, um, pretty much this game is like based on... Um, you have like the cells, you can actually see all the green cells for which is like a applicable move. Uh -huh. So as you can see for this queen, I can actually capture this pawn. And when I capture it, obviously move it to actual like pieces that I captured. It'll move um, to the capturing play side. Yeah. So if you want to do, you can actually show you like more advanced moves. So like castling. So let's say we're black here and we want to castle this castle. 
I showed this one, which is usually not high, shouldn't be highlighted because the king can be more than two spaces. But wow, we can castle, and you can. That successfully works. Actually, <laughs> castle. Very cool. Yeah. Very cool. So, um, yeah, uh, I. <laughs> in I making this. Oh, yeah. I, go. I was gonna just say, in making this project, this was probably like uh, one of the harder projects for me to make uh, because you know making like all the legal moves possible and like have the ability to checkmate um was yes. an inter interesting challenge um especially i've never really uh used javascript or 3gs this is like my first time so having to work with that as well as like working on like a pseudo chess engine is <laughs> interesting but um I'd, I'd say rewarding challenge uh i'm actually really happy with how it turned out in the end oh once again, for you guys watching at home, just to give you a bit of background, uh, the expectation for this subject is not that uh, these guys make a game, but they did. They went the extra mile. So they built the system from scratch, and on top of that, they, they put out all the game mechanics to make it functional. That's that's really impressive. Um, a question from the audience: Does it interface with a chess engine? I'm uh, no, is in there, yeah. It's a no. self-contained system. All it's self-contained the... If I was to work on this project later, I would definitely actually um, make that uh, make that an actual thing. So you can actually put into put in like um, put in like chess other chess games from like chess.com or something like that. If you have like a string, you just put it in and it'll like reload a game. You can you can also experiment with like saving games and loading games, all that stuff. I would I'd really like to work on that if I did have more time. Ooh, very nice. Sorry. Actually, you can see here, sorry, um, okay. that uh, right now the test surgeon realizes that, oh, I mean, this king's currently in check, so you actually can't do any of the other moves. So the only move you can do is the horse take queen, because that prevents check. So. Wow, that's a lot in 3JS. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so another shameless plug in the Playmakers dev team, Francisco is one of our two programming leads. So again doesn't really surprise me that he's gone that extra mile to to oh. really hammer out a whole full chess engine as well as no it'd be you know it'd be. <laughs> also shout out to jordan shout out to jordan for the hades inspiration i this game was inspired by hades once again i'd like to like to just come back here great Ooh. Sure. <laughs> oh right <laughs> okay uh thank you very much guys we should probably thank move you. along oh, thank you yes it was really good to see thank you guys Okay, guys, welcome back. So this is our last student project, um, and this one comes from a different subject, and it's a really special subject because it's, again, one of those subjects where we don't expect students to make a game. It's a, it's a bit different. It's a research-based subject where students pick on a topic uh, of interest, and they work uh, with a supervisor, and they investigate a topic uh, in a lot of detail or really deeply. So the next project is really cool. I had the chance to work with Jacob closely on this stuff, and Jacob, over to you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, as um, Jamie said, this research is more, mainly uh, research focused, and so it doesn't have as many visuals as all the others might have. Um, so on self-driving cars and the ethics, um, self-driving cars have been around since about the 80s. Here's a bit of history. Uh, not much, but um, they've made significant progress in just the two year 2000s with um, autonomous driving in urban traffic with light traffic and all that uh but there's still issues like in may 2016 when 
a Tesla Model S crashed and killed the driver. And there's a few questions around why that might have happened. Um, so moving on, we got like some benefits of why you might want a self-driving car. Um, so the potential to reduce, oh, it's lagging a little bit. So they got the potential to reduce car accidents by eliminating drunk driving, distracted driving with like texting or conversations, or even if you're just stressed, you can reduce the car emissions through smoother driving. Um, and it's even got the possibility to reduce driving times. So then we have like the negative effects of self-driving cars. Um, they may possibly eliminate jobs in the transport in industry. They are more susceptible to hacking due to being online. And there's a few ethical and philosophy issues um, surrounding uh, these self-driving cars, such as what's up next, the uh, trolley problem. So imagine you have an old man walking down in front of the car and you don't have enough time to stop. Would you A, swerve off the road where a group of like five kids are playing, for example, or continue straight and try your best to break? Now, there could be many other like, scenarios, like swerve in the other direction or something, but for the sake of the research, we're just trying to limit the scope just to, um, just to keep it simpler. Otherwise, it would go for a long time, this research. So the aim isn't to come up with a solution when faced with a trolley, the trolley problem, but to evaluate if a solution is possible um, using an AI or a neural network and a series of surveys. Uh, so to do that, uh, sorry, I'm just skipping through these a bit quick. Um, so we have a, some scopes here that we just to limit the scope of the project to um, just so the research doesn't go for a long time, the surveys that are conducted aren't so complex that no one would want to do them. Uh -huh. So just, there's just five. The key ones that we're assuming, though, is that we're limiting the uh, people involved in the trolley problem to just the age and the number of people involved, and that the car is able to rec recognize the number of people and their age 100% of the time. There's, all, there's other important ones up there on the screen as well. So the survey, there's the QR code to the survey if you want to look for yourself. Um, it's got a few questions, about 30 or so, but 24 of the questions are regarding the trolley problem. Um, and each question involves an age group and a number of people. So there's three age groups in it. There's people under 15, people greater than 60, and people between the 20s and 50s. Um, again, you could go more specific with that, but that just takes extra time and added complexity. You have two ratios of people involved. So five people to one in the trolley problem and one to, oh, sorry, and three to three, so equal. Um, so the results of this, with 71 responses that I've had and 24 regarding the trolley problem in specific, that's about 1,704 um, answers, uh, if you multiply them together, to use for the neural network. Um, and it took each person about 10 to 12 minutes to complete. So this is an example of one of the questions that we might have. The majority of people chose to either save people that are younger or the group with more people. Um, that's not everyone, as you can see below. And there might be some outliers, uh, but I couldn't guarantee if they were trolling or not. So I couldn't remove them because that's just adding my own bias into it. So I just have to hope that with the numbers that would um, overcome any bias or any kind of trolling that I might inevitably have with a public survey. Um, so this one here, this is how neural networks uh, basically work. So they're taking an input, which will be the average age of each group, a, group A or group B, and the number of people involved. It'll process the input and then give an output of 
should it go in continue straight or change directions? Um, so each so through a series of itera iterations through the one thousand seven hundred and four uh, individual answers that I had, um, it achieved about an eighty percent accuracy, uh, which is pretty good. If I had more data, I'd be able to have even more um, accuracy. I'm assuming. And so my conclusion of how it went is successful, that uh, it is a viable option, but would need to be explored further. Um, as an example as well, I have, I have a thing to show real quick. If I can get it up, but it's a bit slow. So here, if we, um, for example, we go, the average age of people going straight is like, let's just say 50. And the number of people going straight will say five. And then the average age of people in the other direction is 12. And then the number of people will go five as well. Uh, you can make your own guesses of what you think it will do. There's a problem, but hang on a second. It wants, it wants, um, Um, it should, so I'll just fix this quickly. Um, it should pick the group with the younger, um, age group, at least from my, me studying it. So if we go through, you see, it should change directions and in the other direction is with the average age of five or yeah, well, the, those numbers are the wrong way around, but average age of five, if you remember me typing it in. Um, so I can put a few others in. This is the source code of the project. Um, if anyone is interested or anything, to have a look at it, make changes, make it even better, um, feel free. But yeah, that's the project, and I consider that a success of what's happened so far. Very cool. Yeah. So I, I do a lot of work in machine learning, especially machine learning for games and so forth. And yeah, it's quite common to have the control problems and trying to use neural networks for the actual car control. But what I really like about this project is that, that it flips it on its head and it's the using the neural network to work out the ethics of a decision rather than just trying to do raw control problems, um, which is a very interesting take. And I, I'm sure I'd love to see that kind of idea used for other ethical issues and other ethical problems as well. Yeah, I really like the, the methods that were used for this study because we actually ask people, like real people, and put them in front of all these scenarios and, and had them made a decision. And that's what was used to train the AI agent. So that's really impressive. Very nice. Yes, thank cool. you. All right, thank you very much. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. No, okay, so the next two projects that we have are extracurricular ones and ones by our alumni. Um, so that is essentially, uh, those are just extra at the end. Uh, so it closes our voting. So uh, we'll show those uh, two projects. So you'll have uh, 10 to 15 minutes to go cast your vote. After that time, we are grabbing the winners straight away and we'll be announcing them uh, just probably closer to eight o'clock. Uh, so if you haven't voted, please do it now. Please make sure you cast your vote for all three categories of uh, game design studio. So the third year subject, introduction to game design, the second year and elective subject, and all these projects in 3D animation, computer graphics, and games and graphics project. All right, uh, we will switch over uh, to the next project. Uh, and yeah, thank you very much, Jacob. Thank you. Thank you.
All right, ladies and gentlemen, um, this is a very professional uh, stream that we've got going on, a very professional screen share. Uh, so this is the CAPS Collective. This is a group of students, uh, a group of alumni from the Bachelor of Science in Games Development and a uh, Bachelor of Science in IT. Uh, ben, I'm software software engineering, technically. Software engineering, okay. So all over the UTS IT degrees. Um, so yeah, the uh, these students made this original project. It was called Ozymandias. Um, you can actually go find it in the Autumn Showcase website uh, from last year, from 2020. And they've been working on it since. And yeah, they recently have been putting it on Steam and pushing ahead with it. So it's really exciting to see how far this has come along. Uh, so I'll leave you to it, guys. That's great. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, unfortunately, we weren't able to share our audio properly through this stream, so uh, Jonathan's agreed to just beatbox throughout the whole thing. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so this is Fantasy Town Regional Manager. Uh, we have been working on this, you know, on and off as a bit of a hobby throughout the past year, and it's been just really exciting to see how we've managed to, to take this small little idea that we were building, you know, in GDS1 and make a full game out of it that's actually on Steam. Look, we've got the overlay and everything. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, we've recently uh, been releasing a demo through Steam Next Fest. So there was a, a showcase where there was a bunch of demos and that was, like, really exciting and we got a bunch of, you know, uh, demo people playing and feedback and people have been uploading the playthroughs on YouTube and stuff like that and it's just been a wild time. Uh, do we want to talk a bit about some of the changes that we've made over the past year? Uh, why don't one of you all start? Uh, well, we have changed the UI a lot. I had nothing to do with that, so I can't really tell you about it. Um, but I added grass, which is really cool, and I'm insanely proud of that. Uh, it really makes the, the world come to life. I, I think the big difference is, is, yeah, updates to the UI, we've really tried to streamline the process and make it clearer for new players. Uh, previously, things were very uh, bulky and heavy, and you kind of had to, like, really understand how everything worked before you could start playing it properly, whereas now we've tried to streamline things a little. I think what we uh, consistently forget about the big changes that have happened since uh, we were running this as part of GDS1 um, was that we kind of realized that the mechanics uh, lent themselves very well. We had buttons on the bottom for like the buildings that you select. Uh, it took us a while to figure it out, but we'd actually built a... A, a collectible card, card game, basically. Yeah. Card game. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, so, yeah, because the, the whole idea is that you unlock new buildings over time and the buildings have to scrape values and like, you know, placement costs and stuff like that. Yeah, so it plays perfectly with like kind of this card system. Uh, so we were using a bunch of like, we used a tweening library and built up some nice little animations for the cards. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah. Was, that was a lot of fun. We just really, we really leaned into it. And I think now like the best elevator pitch that we can give for the game is it's a town builder, but it's also uh, a, a collectible card game. And that crossover twist uh, kind of uh, uh, is a hook unto itself. Yeah, um, that's that's yeah, that's a good point. So for people who are like new to the whole experience of what this game is, who haven't seen it previously, effectively we're building a game where you're managing the town uh, that would like take place in like an MMO RPG or a Skyrim or like one of those classic fantasy adventures. Uh, D and D comes to mind. Like like a lot of the stories and things that we've told through it have just been. Uh, you know, like D and D adventures gone awry that we've turned into these like little newspaper events. Um, it 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 became it started as a fun writing exercise, and now it has turned uh, into uh, the dreaded slog of writing hundreds and hundreds of these newspaper articles. Uh, we have over two hundred unique articles at this point in time, and yes. we're gonna need a lot more uh, going towards release. Yeah, yeah, making this... replay. Oh, you go. Yep. I was going to say, like, pretty much most of what you're seeing, why we did do in GDS 1, by the way. Like, a lot of, it's a lot of, like, background stuff that we did, like, after that. And a little bit of the aesthetics on the buildings and the grass. But m pretty much the majority of the game was created uh, in GDS 1, which is really fun. Yeah, a, a lot of these well, buildings also... have been models as well, which I think was a, is a big change. It's a lot of differentiation and kind of stylistic choices, like the little handbills and stuff. Aria? 
Yeah, well, it's also worth noting that um, the game also took a change in like overall vision and design, like after GDS one. So for example, it was called Ozymandias beforehand <laughs> uh, because the whole concept of the game was that basically your town would be destroyed constantly and you'd have to rebuild it over and over again. And it was sort of like this roguelite element over that. Um, and over time, and over time, that's the reason why we sort of made the change to Fantasy Town Regional Manager is because like it didn't fully, that, you know, that didn't fully reflect what the game was actually doing um the name ozymandias we wanted to go to more of like a light-hearted sort of thing with it um so a lot of mechanics have changed for that so i think i think earlier on it was more about managing different resources but now we've changed that to be focused on different heroes and different sort of adventures that you might get and how they interact with each other um so there are a couple of design things that also changed for the game as well in between we also changed the name partially because of search engine optimization we should be honest <laughs> There's there's a lot of other things called Aussie Mandias out there. <laughs> True. Yeah. Uh yeah. So uh we recently put this up at uh, this demo up at Next Fest and we got a little bit of traction and uh that has been a fun experience, but it has not been uh the most fun to get there. Uh taking this on beyond uh GDS one uh is a little bit different because you don't really have that organized time. Uh, in your schedule to be working on this. So you have to figure out where in your life, uh, you know, taking a game to completion goes. And as as they say, nobody nobody ever tells you that when you make a game, you actually have to finish it. <laughs> yeah, uh, we, we've really tried to make, uh, you know, like reserve sort of like, you know, a, a few hours on the weekend or after work sometimes and stuff like that uh to to kind of dedicate to it but yeah drumming up that motivation when you know you don't have uh you know marks and stuff like that like when you don't actually have it like being graded every two weeks definitely uh means you have to have more self-motivation that's actually um, a really yeah. really interesting insight and i think it's one that applies to games and every project and everything especially when you're doing a startup or making your own business or so forth it's really about that motivation that will to keep going on and not having someone looking over your shoulder and, and it's one of those hard things that even you, you take for granted in a in a standard job that you may have a manager that's always giving you tasks to do in those daily tasks keep you motivated to keep working through it um but when you have to decide your own tasks decide your own priorities and your own project and it's years in the making it can be very hard so the fact that you guys have continued working on this and found time out of your busy careers to keep iterating on it and keep improving on it is a testament to your your determination Fantastic. yeah thanks uh, i i think the the other thing is also you know when we first finished uh you know game development studio we said to ourselves like oh what there's probably only like 20 percent tops left <laughs> like, we were, we're, we're 80 percent to a full release and here's the thing we weren't wrong about that like we were 80 percent in terms of features but that last 20 percent like you don't realize how much that is yep. uh, you know like because it, it, it's you know all that polish work like really making it feel like a proper game getting it to like a sales ready even like a lot of the stuff like we've learned how to like manage your social media account and stuff like none of us have really done that before yeah. uh we've learned how to set up you know devops pipelines to yeah, push the oh game system Getting, uh, getting, getting this thing up on Steam and understanding how to deal with that. We actually had to do a, we had to do a hot fix during ne uh, Next Fest uh, when we had German and French players contacting us saying that the game broke. Yeah, this uh, is, is a bad bad specifically story. because of localization issues. Who would have yeah, known? There was a bug where it just would not run for for specifically French people. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I mean, and lest we forget, lest we forget the M1 bug with the M1 chip that has a hilarious solution. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so with with that localization issue, the problem was is that different languages pass like uh, like decimal points differently. So you know sometimes they use commas or else they put spacing differently. And what was happening is the save file was trying to read it in German or in French. And because we had written it in English, it was freaking out. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And all, yeah, the, so... all the minor Polish things that you don't even stop to think about when you start to release globally. Well, right? you, have to, you have to start supporting platforms and, and yeah. you know, having having that pipeline together and understanding how your, how your ticketing process works and, and uh, how you're going to be able to make sure that your release runs on at least like 80% of people's computers is 
uh, is a challenge uh, that you don't really think yeah. about when you're going through the subject. Awesome. Uh, well, I might have to stop it there, but thank you very much for coming back and sharing. And yeah, with all these showcases, if you have more updates, come and show us again. I love seeing how this game progresses every single time. And especially Thanks for the time. All, all the students that are currently in the room, if you do something similar and you become alumni of UTS and you keep working on a project, whether it's in games or any of your other IT subjects, please let us know. We are very yeah. proud of our students and our alumni. So if you have something to show, let us know. One, one last point that I would love to say is uh, if other students are looking to do something similar of, you know, publishing their games or getting things out there, uh, we are super open to, you know, having a chat, talking about some of the learnings we've had. We've really learned a few things the hard way and our biggest goal is that, like, we want to take the stuff that we've learned and help other students and other up-and-comers, you know, get to, you know, get to where they should be going. Fantastic. That's really cool um so yeah if if you haven't already done so please jump into the youtube chat and if you have like a contact uh details for the caps collective post it in there uh just so that people oh, can get in contact wish list on steam there we go that's it <laughs> yeah we, we gotta, wish, we gotta get that plug in there real quick yeah, get, yeah. wish list us please follow yeah. us on twitter go to steam wish list it download the demo if it's still available um and Ooh. yeah all of that helps these guys out so thank you very much guys and we have one more project and then we'll get to the winners of the showcase Bye. Bye, guys. Bye. Good luck, everyone. All right, everyone, this is our last project. So this was a game made in a game jam uh, in the Game Makers Toolkit game jam, the really famous one that you can find on YouTube that has like 10,000 submissions or something each year. Um, so yeah, this team, I think, right, you're all from the Playmakers dev team. Um, yep. So yep. all uh, Playmakers dev team uh team members decided hey why not we already know how to work together we already know how to work in a tight-knit group we know each other's strengths and weaknesses because we've been working together for a few uh, months so they decided to enter in the game jam and smash out this gem of a game in two days so over to you guys yep so um yeah we, we i think we got um we got top 200 overall for nice. for this game and uh, like top 35 for presentation i think yeah so we got this gorgeous looking game wow so um the game's pretty simple. Essentially, you kind of, if you run the game, it's kind of just like you've got this witch and you've got this cat and it's joined together. That's the game jam team joined together. And you basically have to keep them joined together. Um, and you, you want to dodge those obstacles and make sure that they're going really, uh, to get tangled up. Um, you can release the cat. You can, you can throw the cat essentially. And you have to make sure not to, uh, you have to catch it back again. Make sure you. You don't just lose it. Uh, yeah. So, <laughs> so it makes me laugh. Yeah. Every so time. I think. <laughs> yeah. So I think. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I, th I think I found the team quite interesting. So out of the PDT, I think we kind of took people who are just really, like I think we took a couple people that had some cool ta cool, cool talents. I guess we had a good technical card, so we had cool kind of like. Uh, effects like especially like the photo effect we had a good animation artist we made our own audio so unlike any other game i think like we, we custom made our audio and made it look good i think we had someone who completely was audio the entire jam we had programmers and we had someone kind of sorting out the team as well with like a project manager of some sorts 
So shout so, out yeah. to Beatrice and Jake, right? For the visuals yeah, the Beatrice audio? for the for the art. Beatrice isn't here, unfortunately, and then Jake's here with the. For yeah, the audio. so Beatrice helped out with the art, the animation, and partially in the music as well. And I did all the, pretty much all the audio, the sound effects, and the music. Yeah. Um, the visuals. No wonder you got Metallica <laughs> 5 uh, with the visuals yep, combined yep, with the yep. visuals and audio for the presentation. Join for technical art. Mm. Um, yeah we had a lot of challenges with like the design um we really try to make the game fun but we were just having a lot of troubles just finding what was fun um and so like we finally found out how to make the game fun in like the last 12 hours and we're like mm -hmm. oh, okay now we have something and then started to um iterate on it mm. Very yeah. cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, cool. Cool few things is like the photo stacking. Um, pretty inventive from and innovative from Jordan. Uh, the entire like camera, the postcard popping up, and so on. Uh, Did the postcards someone... actually stack on each other? So there's like a screenshot of the previous one in the background, or is it just a. Uh, yeah, yes. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> So, a question with from the chat. The, How did you get the cat noises? Uh, I wish Beatrice was here. <laughs> uh, we were asked that a few times, actually. So, the cat noises, they were just from a sound library called Splice. So I just basically... Well, there aren't, there aren't that many, so I looked through the more, I tried to find the good ones, and I just had to cut them up, try and um, make them sound more cat-like, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Because like because um some of them also partially have um it's partially um what's it called I, th I think it's partially a cheater as well it's like laid in the back slightly of one of them but yeah so so you mix it domestic so no live to... animals were harmed in this game <laughs> um <laughs> well at least not from my hand <laughs> yeah. Very nice. How about the um the rope physics? How did you find coding data? Oh, oh my god, that took like took forever. I think this is based mostly on music physics, but I think I I don't really play too much with music physics. I just kind of I'm more used to kind of like making the mechanics. So this is my first time I'm just interacting a lot with physics. Um, and yeah, I think it tried everything. I was like, okay, try this, try that, try this, try that, didn't work. And then finally it got it to work like at the end. So glad. Uh, Nice. But, uh, I think the rope is essentially like a, a bunch of joints. It's like a bunch of joints together. It's like, imagine there was like a skeleton. Yeah, like a big skeleton bone. And you kind of just dangle it around, essentially. And um, yeah, that kind of, that's basic gist of it, actually. It's pretty much built in that way. Fantastic. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. And thanks for sharing. And yeah, everyone else. Um, Keep an eye out for game jams, uh, whether they're held at ETS, whether they're ones online, there's always one going on at HIO. Um, but yeah, the Game Makers Toolkit is definitely one to note. Um, and if you do well in it, it's a lot of notoriety, so it's well worth taking a chance on it. Um, and yeah, you can do it by yourself, or you can do it in a small team, or even a larger team. So I, I think that this uh, PDT group is five members, six members. Um, that's already getting on the larger side uh, for a game jam. Um, that's not the size of full Playmakers Dev Team. That uh, that's we got 18 people I think running this semester. Uh, nice but yeah, there's, there's yeah. just a subset of the team here. But yeah, in a game jam, there's usually not that many people. Um, so yeah, if you want to join in with one of your friends, make a game, get some recognition uh, if you do well in it. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And then yeah, <laughs> with these kind of showcases, share it, share it with us, show it off like this, um, so that we can show the rest of the world with the rest of the machines. All right, uh, we will take uh, just a quick. Uh, two three minute break um, to make sure we've got the winners all noted down from your voting and we'll come back and we'll announce those winners. So we'll be right back. See you in a minute or two. Thank you. Thank you.
All right. okay. Welcome back, everyone. And this is the most exciting part of the night. Uh, this is the time where we get to announce the winners of each category. So, are you guys ready for this? <laughs> yep. <Pretty excited. laughs> I'm sorry, yeah. we have to be excited <laughs> because chat's going to be delayed. <laughs> well, what's what's chat going to be like? Um... <laughs> They're okay. saying it's I been three minutes, say... we took too long. They've all bailed oh. out. <laughs> Oh, um, so when can you please uh, free stream my screen? Uh, yep. Thank you. Ah. Okay. Uh, okay, sweet. Good. So, uh, just to give you guys a bit of numbers, we've got a really amazing response. Uh, we've got 222 votes for Game Design Studio One, 234 votes for Intro to Game Design, and 156 votes for all the other projects, which is really impressive. And um, by the way, thank you guys for sticking around. I know it's it's you know it, it's three hours of your life in front of a screen, and we truly appreciate that. Um, so, are you guys ready to hear all the winners? <laughs> I feel like we're getting yes. a drum roll from oh, the organizing so committee. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, the best game in Game Design Studio One is. <laughs> Tom with 45% of the votes. That's almost 100 uh, votes. Thank you, guys. Wow, good job. Congratulations. Fantastic Congratulations. job. Thank you. Um, just as a heads up, we do have <laughs> your prizes, and uh, I think we still have the trophies, right? And certificates. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we'll say that to the end then. That's my next slide, yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah, okay, nice. <laughs> Jump in the gun. Go for it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. So, uh, best game okay. in intro to game design. All right. Um, so, it's Vampire it and Begetting Over It. So, because these are quite close, in the grand scheme of these voting schemes, whenever we do these showcases, we look for clear winners. In this case, that is actually not a very statistically significant difference between the votes. So, we have two winners. So, congratulations yeah. to both Vampire and Begetting Over It uh, for a job well done. And yeah, that's it's fantastic to see. So, congratulations. Yay. Well done. Next, the best student project in 3D animation, games and graphics project, and computer graphics. Yes, that will be going to the Daymare of Tobias Truman. Um, congratulations, that well deserved. Very nice, guys. <laughs> congratulations, everybody. Yes. Cool. So, I presume at this point you're wondering what the prices are, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm very curious. I didn't know anything about this. <laughs> okay, cool. So, the prices are... A 50 bucks gift card for each of the members in each team. And a beautifully designed trophy. Oh, that is and so cool. Yep, and I'd like to thank uh, Nico and the Protospace team for helping us with this stuff. Uh, Nico helped us with creating the actual figure and the three, uh, the three uh, the protospace people actually printed this out. They happen to be in UTS now, but can pick them up right now. And even if I had them with me, you guys are not here with me. <laughs> so I'll give you, I'll give it to you guys when I see you next time. So as a little heads up, everyone who did three, uh, intro to computer graphics, um, you know, Nico, uh, so that is one of his, one of his own algorithms um, that takes essentially a 3D model and hollows it out and makes a lattice structure to one, save you on cost for 3D printing, but still keep the structural integrity so that it doesn't break when it prints, which is quite the feat. Um, so it is quite a rare trophy to have, and it's essentially from his own uh, sweat, <laughs> making yeah, it in, in years of worth of coding and developing these algorithms. So, oh, congratulations. And last but not least, I like to get, put you guys on the spotlight and these are the members of the organizing committee. So this is the first time uh, in five years that we've got uh, a group of students to help with this stuff. And these are all final year students. Um, they happen to be in my class. And I'm really thankful for all the help I've received from you guys, what well, we've received from you guys in the past few weeks. Uh, it's been a massive piece of work and it's been four to five weeks of 
you know, meeting all the time, and each of you have taken a specific role in the whole team, and you guys made it all possible. And I'm really proud of what you've done, and I'm really thankful for all your help. So I just wanted all the viewers to see you guys, and I don't think we are all in the screen, are we? Uh, no, we're not. I think. Oops. No. <laughs> Works on uh, okay. uh, that That's all the people that are in the, the chat at the moment. Yes. Okay, cool. Uh, oh, guys, I think this is it. Um, once again, thank you so much for sticking around and stay tuned for a amazing night full of games. And thank you guys again, like the organizing committee, for all the help. Uh, by the way, I think you can see me now. These are the prices. I have them with me. <laughs> I'll give it to you guys. Uh, well, I know I'm going to go break into James' house tonight, so... <laughs> I'll make sure you guys get all this beauty stuff. <laughs> So thank you everyone for showing off your games and participating um, and for all your work in making sure that this all ran very smoothly. Uh, we're getting better at these online ones, but it really would be nice to get a physical <laughs> one going at some stage. So cross fingers that you all do well in lockdown in Sydney at the moment. Um, and we'll see you next semester. And then big cross fingers that we can actually have a physical one of these showcases uh, at the end of spring and get to yeah, actually get hands crossed. on with the games and chat with you. Hopefully. Totally. Fingers crossed. All right, take us out, Jamie. Okay. See you guys <laughs> next time. Take care. See you, everybody. Bye. Bye. <laughs>